Hey, Dumpster Dwellers, just wanted to give you a heads up for this episode. Had a bit of an audio issue with uh, Connor's file, so if you hear any scratchiness or it sounds like uh, a little pitched up, uh, that's why. Hope you enjoy the show. Hey, what's up? Welcome to Movie Dumpster Season 2, Episode 17. Today we're talking Child's Play 3 from 1991, directed by Jack Bender. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor. This movie is in a world of shit McGraw. I'm C.B. Smith. Welcome to The Dumpster. All right, kid. Fun's over. Where the hell's Andy? Andy? Can't you read? He was supposed to get this package. Tampering with the mail is a federal offense. Sorry. Is he your best friend? He's more than that. He's my new lease on life. Wait a minute. I got a new body, and I ain't told anyone about my little secret yet. So, uh, what's your name, kid? Tyler. What's yours? Chucky. But, uh, my real name is Charles Lee Ray. So yeah, we got a special guest today with us, uh, C.B. Smith. You want to uh, introduce yourself, sir? Well, all right. Uh, I'm C.B. Smith. I run a YouTube channel with that name. Uh, There's a show on there called Taking a Page, where I talk about books and their adaptations. And uh, even though this movie had a novelization, you guys asked me to come here more because uh, I recently got out of basic training back in April. And, well, this is taking place at a military academy. There's, There's like a couple things in the movie that... You guys don't notice, but we're freaking screaming at me. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, because the whole time I was kind of thinking to myself, like, is this how a military academy really works? Yeah, I was, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, this isn't how this happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you conflated boot camp and military school. <laughs> Scared straight and whatever the fuck this is. Well, that was, that was the thing. It's like, I'm watching, I'm like, well, okay, this is in the 90s. It's a military academy, not basic training, so there would be some differences, but there, there, there's stuff in there that I know should not be, and it's just, wow. Yeah. Come on, every school has a war game uh, scenario, right? Sure, why not? Dude, we didn't even have war games. I mean, it wasn't on like this, that's for sure. I think that's so interesting that you're on a channel um, talking about the novelizations of films. Now, more often than not, do you do like... Um, the novel, like, pre the movie, like, like a Jaws kind of thing, or like post the movie, like, like this film? Uh, usually it's, uh, it's pre movie, but I did do one episode on Hook, which actually was turned to a novelization. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, Terry Brooks, the guy who wrote the Shannara Chronicles, he, uh, he did the novelization for it. It was actually pretty good. Really? So did he just, like, rewrite, uh, he made it, he did, like, his own kind of Peter Pan thing? Well, like, you can tell that he was actually a fan of Peter Pan. Right, right. Which was why, like, his novelization was, like... You can, like, you. it was good. Most novelizations, though, are not. Like this movie. Yeah, not everything can be the Resident Evil novelization. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like that. I'm being, I'm giving it a compliment. What, what was it? The Umbrella Conspiracy? That was great. Oh, yeah. Kind of like Smith was uh, saying, you know, I've been trying to get him to come on the show for a while, just kind of like talking about movies uh, back and forth, and, you know, this just seemed like a perfect fit, and uh, wouldn't you know it, the remake's coming out today. Oh, man. Aren't you guys excited for that piece of shit? I'm kind Kinda interested. Let me tell you something. It looks like dog shit. Okay. All right. Now, now that we've transitioned into the child's play topic, I'm just gonna come out and I'm gonna come out and front load this conversation with this this volcanic hot take. Okay, you ready for it? Sure. I don't fucking like any of the child's play movies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's one, and it's Bride of Chucky, and that's it. Oh, you like Bride of Chucky? Out of all of them, that's your favorite? I like Bride of Chucky because it makes me laugh. And <laughs> the other ones make me want to pull my hair out. Uh, didn't the second one have Chucky uh, beat a teacher to death with a ruler? Oh, yeah. You've been very naughty, Mrs. What's-Your-Face. Miss Kettlewell. Thank you for highlighting the complete immersion-shattering uh, uh, idea that, like, this is a foot and a half tall 
a rubber toy. I don't care if he's got some meat in there. Like, I have 190 pounds on you. I'll just lay on top of you until I can find a way to deal with you. I'm not terrified of you. I don't think you're very funny. Okay. I, I don't like these movies at all. I think they're very endemic of, like, the problems at the slasher boom. I, I disagree with you. Oh, no, I know I'm in the minority of people who like horror films who don't like child's play. That's totally fine. I, I feel like your sentiment comes a lot from, like, the later films. The first film is near pitch perfect. I mean, we got Tom Holland directing, Don Mancini wrote it, and Tom Holland was like, hey, Don, that's great and all, but here, let me make this really good. And he did. It's fucking awesome. The first movie I find to be inoffensive, but I just don't care for it. Sure. And then anything beyond that, conceptually, I'm like, will you fuck off with this? The funniest thing, before this, uh, I watched this movie, I had a little extra time, so I watched the first and second one, because I, I saw the first one years ago and barely remembered it. But like Joe's saying, the first one is legitimately well done. And, you know, the second one gets a little rote. There's things about it I like, there's things about it I don't like, but the first one's really just holds up super well. Two gets a little wacky. The horror elements are still there, but it, it kind of, it's very, if I had to compare it to anything, I compare it to like a funhouse mirror. Like if Child's Play looked into a funhouse mirror, that's what Child's Play 2 is. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't seen these movies in like, what, 12, 15 years. The last one I saw was the one where like they had a kid who was British, but also Japanese. And he was like transgender, but not. And Seed of Chucky. Okay. Yeah. Now that now you brought the second, the, the, the second part of the, the Child's Play series that infuriates me. Fucking kill me. It won't fucking die. <laughs> we got, we have a remake coming out. Another Don Mancini fucking Child's Play. Not even Child, it's not even called Child's Play anymore. It's called Chucky. Yeah. It's like Hellraiser. Will you fuck, like, stop insulting me personally, I feel like at this point. Well, Hellraiser is more of a personal insult to me because those movies keep chugging on being awful. Yeah, but this is such a bizarre thing. I don't know who is making the decision going like, yeah, there's still millions of dollars to be made off of this carcass. Like, we have a remake, more sequels, a TV show coming out. Here's the thing. There's three separate entities going. This is like the DC problem, <laughs> right? There's three separate things going on here. Oh, you say that I'm wearing a brand new Flash t-shirt. Now I'm going to cry all over again. You have, I I don't know if it, who is it, MGM or Orion Pictures or whoever the fuck has the rights to the Child's Play name, right? So Child's Play is being remade and it comes out today. We're going to talk about that in a second. And then you have Don Mancini's Chucky series, which starts with Seed of Chucky and then snowballs into like a pie, like the worst fucking shit garbage films that I you ever have laid fucking eyes on. Like, they're they're terrible. They're so bad that Jennifer Tilly, who was in Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky, is even quoted as saying that they suck. Yeah, she's in both of them. I mean, she needs a paycheck. I get it. I just want to get this out of the way real quick before we get into it, because the disdain I have for Don Mancini is like, he is so bitter about the fact that Tom Holland came up with like the whole voodoo thing and like transferring the soul of a serial killer into the doll, which to me is fucking disgustingly creepy. Like, I again, like I've mentioned this on the show before, like I was always afraid of my toys coming to life and killing me or doing something while I'm while I'm not watching. Yeah, like the hug a bunch. I'm still kind of afraid of them. Maybe that's part of my problem. I'm not like I don't see any fear in that scenario. Okay, I right, understandable, but it freaks me out, right? Rewatch the first one. I'll just say that because they justify it pretty well in that film. It's pretty damn good. If you like the voodoo stuff, uh, I I might be able to disappoint you there because the novelization worked uh, like they did weird things with it, man. I'm excited to hear all about that, man. So again, like the whole thing was Don Mancini. The the, the original idea was that Andy is the killer in the film. Like, he, you know, he's he's touched. He's like, it's like Pinocchio's Revenge, you know, at the end where, right. like, the little girl, spoiler, <laughs> the little girl is the killer. Oh, no! How dare you! Uh-oh! The little girl is the killer, not the doll. You know what I mean? And she blames it on the doll or whatever. Oh, that's actually, that's actually really interesting. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it is interesting, but what's even cooler is the fact that this man has transferred his fucking soul into a doll and, like, comes alive and, and kills people. I don't know. I think that shit's fucking cool. Yeah. Don Mancini hated that. MGM loved it. And then Tom Holland made Child's Play. And now every time Don Mancini makes a fucking movie, he's got to, like, throw a dig in there about that voodoo shit, right? Well, I'm Chucky. I'm voodoo. I can do whatever I want. I'm tongue-in-cheek, and this is fucking stupid. Who could give a shit about Seed of Chucky, 
Curse of Chucky, Cult of Chucky, who could fucking care? But here's my problem with that then. If he hated the voodoo shit so much, how come the end of Child's Play 1, the majority of Child's Play 2, and pretty much most of this movie, he's doing the voodoo shit and Dan Man's the guy fucking wrote all of them. I don't know, man. Like, there was a point where he's like, this is stupid, and this is also my legacy, so I'm just gonna make fun of it in the movies that I'm making. What a self-loathing approach to this. Right? It's a kiss of death for me, because it's just like, oh, there's that guy from the first one, and there's that chick from the second one and who could give a shit and to go back to brian chucky real quick i think the reason i like it is from a stylistic approach because ronnie you also did freddy vs jason which is a movie i really fucking like both of those movies feel like connor <laughs> <laughs> when i watch bride of chucky and and freddy vs jason i'm like I, I think i was like this feels like a connor mcgraw movie yeah <laughs> i'm not saying it's bad i'm just saying this movie I just want to plot crunch it just, just real quick. We've been shot through the heart, thrown in a fireplace, decapitated, <laughs> stuck in a fucking vat of, of plastic and blown up with a fucking air hose, hand cut off, turned into a fucking knife, melted, and here we are. And you just described why the first two movies are pretty fucking good. Oh, they're so fun. I will say this. If someone presented me a film that was just like, Flight of the Valkyries for 90 minutes and a, a supercut of Chucky getting fucking pulverized, I'd watch the bejesus out of it. Well, you know, the, to no surprise, he comes back again. Spoiler. And uh, in this movie, it's it's eight years after the second one, and uh, Andy Barclay's off at military school, and Chucky somehow magically finds out, and uh, he fucking goes after him. Yeah. We're only a year off from Child's Play 2. But somehow in the universe of Child's Play, in the CPU, it's fucking uh, eight years. <laughs> I will not let that be a thing. The, the fucking CPU. That's what I'm saying. Like, as far as these movies go, like, there's one, two, and three, maybe Bride for me, and the rest you can fucking keep. Yeah. I don't know why we dropped the moniker of Child's Play. I mean, maybe it was like a, a rights thing or whatever, but like... I, I found it kind of funny because on Wikipedia, the way they explain that away is like, well, you know, the first three is about how they're trying, he's trying to get with a child and then in four, he's not. So it's just kind of Chucky. So it's the Chucky movie. It's not It's not Child's Play anymore. Fuck you. That's like what I used to call it when I was a kid. You know, fucking Chucky one and Chucky two. Right. Well, it's like what you call family matters. It's like, I just want to watch the Urkel show, guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think Bride was the ceiling for how far you can stress this concept and anything else. And then anything after that is like, what are you doing? I, I mean, maybe if you want to return to form, that's one thing. But no, now he has to be a rogue AI voiced by Mark Hamill. Ugh. Mark Hamill cannot save this film. I'm sure his voice acting is top notch. I'm sure all of these actors are great. Uh, but this remake looks like fucking dog shit. Can somebody please explain to me? Why the fuck special effects from 1988 look better, like leaps and bounds better than the shit we're getting in 2019? Dude, if you can explain that, can someone else explain to me how you can make a modern day Chucky movie about kid playing with dolls? Like who the fuck plays with dolls right now? <laughs> Right. You're absolutely correct. And who gives a fuck if it's an artificial intelligence, if it's a fucking AI doll? Nobody's buying that shit. To pick up where Sean left off, uh, this is eight years after Chucky's. So he's, I don't remember the second movie very well. I know I've seen it. So like Joe said, he, he gets this fucking, this hot plastic poured out him by Andy. And then Andy sticks a fucking loose hose that just fire an air off into his mouth and he blows up like the guy at the end of that one James Bond movie. Well, it was it was Kyle. Let's not let's not forget uh, Christy Elise. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that secondary character. She's like the big sister foster sister. But yeah, so he's still there. He's caked in dust like everything else. And, you know, shocker, the good guy company. They're looking to make a little money, so let's take all the old ones in this destroyed fucking factory and redistribute them. <laughs> I know I made the joke in the chat about that one dude looking like Dick Jones from Robocop, but the good guy company at this point in the movie is very OCP like. They're like, well, that was a PR disaster. Let's keep going. Straight up. In the beginning of the fucking second one, they take the literal Chucky doll that gets blown up, decapitated, and everything from fucking Andy Barclay's apartment, and they fucking literally, like, bring it back to life, the exact same doll, and they go to put the eyeballs in, and all of a sudden, fucking uh, Charles Lee Ray comes back to life and electrocutes the fucking technician to death. To, like, 
prove a point. I feel like the se- the 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 rebuild in the second one is more unbelievable, but it's kind of creepier. No, oh, yeah, and sadistic in a from like a point of view where like this fucking crazy business mogul guy is so like trying to cover it up. Yeah, not even trying to cover it up, but like so like we're gonna get this fucking doll. We're gonna prove that this never happened. He's a good guy. Like overzealous bullshit. At least with this one, then just some Chucky blood spills on a vat. Okay, we're eight years off, right? This fucking factory is in shambles. How does he still have blood? Uh, yeah. Exactly. That's why I was getting to that. Uh, this factory's in shambles, right? It's covered in cobwebs and dirt and all kinds of shit. And this fucking ridiculous crane arm comes down, pierces this fucking slop of shit plastic, melted plastic body, and just blood starts oozing out of it like like a gusher fruit snack. And he fucking picks it up and it and it like drags over this old ass vat of plastic that should be no good, and all of a sudden it kicks on. So in the novel, the story actually uh, begins with a rat scurrying around looking for food, and he actually like finds Chucky's like remains, and he bites into it trying to find flesh. And apparently, the blood goes down a drain, so whatever refuse they have in the factory goes into the vat of plastic, according to the book. Oh. So that's even worse, because, like, at least there's a vat of plastic and the blood drops in there, but no, in the book, it's like, no, the entire drainage system just goes into the plastic. (laughs) The blood goes down in the drainage system, and it goes into the plastic vat somehow, as if, like, you're cleaning the factory... And whatever refuse comes in that drain, they just put into the plastic. Oh my god. This adds a whole nother level of scumbaggery to this fucking Play Pals company. Yeah. They sound like an OSHA disaster. Oh yeah. We're fucking giving kids fucking lead paint and shit on their fucking toys. That's what's happening here. So they have the opening credits, and it's I kind of like it. It's awesome. It's like the spinning fucking plastic and blood mixing together like it's like the beginning of Ghost or some shit. Yeah, and then Uncle Frank pops out of it, and he's like, come to daddy. (laughs) Yeah, we'll get to him. (laughs) But the first fucking name that comes on the screen is our friend and wild mother fucking help us, Justin Wayland from Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Predating it, actually. I told you guys about that, and Sean was like, wait a second, Justin Whalen's this movie? Like, yep, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and like, so, against all odds, he's fucking even worse here. Mm. Mm. I had a strange uh, observation. You know, I said in Dungeons & Dragons when we did that episode for the first season that he reminded me of a poor man's Will Wheaton. Oh, yeah. In this movie, he looked like Will Friedle with the fucking Luck of the Irish haircut. Oh, boy. Oh, he's got fucking NSYNC Lance Bass hair this, uh, this whole film. Oh, uh, we'll get to the fucking haircut. I just thought that was kind of funny because, just to me personally, because on the uh, the D and D show Critical Role, uh, Will Friedle and Will Wheaton were on it together, so that's just a weird colliding of universes for me. Full circle. Of course, Brad Dourif's back as Chucky. He's the best part of the films. The special effects and Brad Dourif. Yeah. Brad Dourif just seems like he's having a lot of fun with this, which is what you want in a villain. Yeah. Actually, real quick, fun fact, because uh, Vegas is a weird city. Uh, we were uh, at my animal hospital I work at. We were treating this little chihuahua for something. I can't remember what it was. And it sounded like Brad Dorif. Uh, hang on. I'll get there. <laughs> I look down at the fucking car, and I'm like, Dorif. Where I know that name from? Oh, are you serious? Apparently, this dog belonged to Brad Dorif's like niece or daughter. I can't remember who it was. Was it Fiona? Maybe, maybe that's his daughter, who is now in these fucking movies, by the way. So I guess Chucky gets you know finished getting made by this vat magically, like it's fucking Edward Scissorhands or something. <laughs> Vincent Price is there. We cut to these fucking good guy corp big wigs, and you got the main guy, Mr. Sullivan, returning from the second one. He's kind of like the corporate guy. And uh, again, in the second one, this fucking technician gets electrocuted right in front of this guy, and they, they, they this fucking factory is shut down because they have such a bad reputation from this Chucky doll supposedly killing people. Oh, excuse me, good guy doll. Yeah. And uh, they don't give a fuck at all. They, they're, they're talking, oh, yeah, Andy Barclay, no one remembers him. It's, you know, it's old news. The guy's fucking sitting there comparing nuclear war to selling these dolls. What's bizarre is, like, you, this, okay, so this does, this scene doesn't exist in the second film. You never see, like, the board talking about it. Right. Like, his lackey is just like, yep, got the doll, rebuilt it. And he's like, what the fuck's wrong with you, man? And he's like, why would you fucking rebuild a doll? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I don't know. Here it is. (laughs) That is 
That is a pretty alarming question yeah. for, for someone to not have an answer to. But he's very perturbed by it, the, the main Mr. Sullivan. Yeah. And then, like, in this film, some guy's like, hey, Mr. Sullivan, you know, this is a fucking bad idea. Uh, Why are we even fucking making these again or whatever? Yeah, one guy. Yeah. And the fucking lady's like, good guys was the best-selling toy fucking eight years ago. And Mr. Sullivan's just like, fuck Andy Barkley. Let's, let's make that fucking money, baby, and lights up a fucking cigar. And the rest is history. Everyone in this movie who is above the a certain age, and I'm talking about adults, are like rock stupid. I mean, I think they did a better job in the first two films, kind of giving the adults a pretty good excuse of like, yeah, there's no way a fucking doll got up and walked around and did this. Whereas in this one, I, I mean, I guess that's kind of there, but there's definitely a few instances where I'm like, no one, no, no one noticed this? No one thought this was odd? No one is ever alarmed by a doll that they personally discarded reappearing at a building in various cabinets, trash cans, desk drawers, and in chairs. Right. Well, because in the second one, especially, there's a good scene where the, the, the guy that's watching Andy because in the second one his mother basically is put in a mental institution because no one believes her uh, he throws fucking Chucky down the stairs in the basement Garrett Graham baby yeah and then he goes he kills the fucking teacher comes back and then you know Andy's getting in trouble about it and he's he opens up the basement door and of course Chucky's there so like there's a they've done it before it's honed in so much so for the first and second films that it's mostly about Andy and his family I kind of like the concept of this one like what they were going with was this idea that like Andy's growing up so now he has to face the responsibilities by himself while everyone else like he had the uh, the adults in the other movies take care of it for him now he has to you know you know, take care of it, and now it seems that Chucky is going after someone, like a new kid. Right. So he has that, that what's it, change of hands type of storyline going on? Yeah, kinda, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't really say this in real life, but a kid who kind of deserved what was going to come to him because he's fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you talking about Tyler? This kid's a fucking moron. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I do not like this character. Also, I have a very serious question. This is a military academy, right? Supposedly, yeah. <laughs> okay, and like everyone there is like, they look like they're like 13, 15 to like maybe 20. Tyler looks like he's like seven years old. Who dropped him off and didn't come get him? I, his dad, apparently. He's fighting in the Air Force, but we'll get to his ass. I have so many questions about Tyler, and the book does not help at all. <laughs> Well, you have Sullivan, and you know, like Joe was kind of saying in the first, in the second movie, you know, he's a little freaked out that they went and redid this doll. Whereas in this one, they're like, ah, first one off the production line, the good guy of the nineties. <laughs> yeah. So, he, so it cuts to him, you know, bringing this doll home, and he's in his fucking apartment, drunk as a skunk. And it's like, okay, that's Chucky, obviously. Well, yeah. Well, for us, we're just like, here it comes. It's actually shot pretty well. Like as yeah. far as the horror elements go in this film, I mean, it gets a little lazy towards the middle but like this first scene is 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 pretty good no it's solid it's well shot uh you know you don't see chucky yet and there's like shit moving and you know chucky's moving it but you don't see him do it and you see like his hand grabs some shit and it's basically just like a montage of him fucking with sullivan yeah and he's like he's like turning toys on and throwing fucking marbles all over the floor and he like falls and slips and busts his ass well we, we can never be remiss to uh remember kevin McAllister's famous move that chucky employs here that's where he that's where he gets that from man that he you know fucking McAllister 101 real quick because we didn't really talk about it we just kind of implied a bunch of things but there's this fucking guy called the lakeshore strangler oh yeah played by brad dorif called charles lee ray that in the first movie he gets fucking killed by the guy from Fright Night. The vampire from fucking Fright Night kills him. Fucking Chris Sarandon, dude. And he uh, he does some voodoo magic, and he gets in this this good guy doll. Literal fucking voodoo magic. Voodoo magic, man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you find out in the first and second film that he has a set period of time that he's got to transfer his soul into another person's body. It's got to be the person that he revealed his true name to. Oh, he does? Then I've got some problems with the later part of this movie. Because the first two movies, it's like, oh, well, he did it to Andy. Yeah. So he's trying to get his soul into Andy, and, you know, shit happens in those movies that result in him not doing that the fucking rules man i got a problem with the rules yeah so in the first movie if you care at all he just never gets a chance to finish the incantation but in the second one i guess he just like waits too long and then his body is all like humanoid except he's like chucky size so there's like literally a part where like part of his skin is like gets blown off and it's just like his face gets torn off like the fucking terminator basically and his hand gets chopped off he becomes human and the um the the voodoo priest in the first film tells him that you know he's like that's how that's where he gets all that info from right are you saying that it works kind of like fucking animorphs where 
if you take the form of an animal for, I think the time window in that book was two hours, like you're stuck in that animal form, whereas if Charles is stuck in this doll for too long, his physical body, blood, flesh, and all will be the doll? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. They don't really go into it in this movie for some reason. They just kind of just assume you saw the first two. And there's so, like, there's so many little subtleties in the first and second film that are great like when he gets shot the first time in the in the first movie you see like stuffing come out of him and then later it's blood and he's like what the fuck right oh that's interesting but in this they just gloss over it it's just like yeah i've got gore and robotics yeah there's some really cool shit in the first one anyway back to this film he takes this this, this guy has a fucking putter he's got like the little uh putting green in his fucking apartment and uh because if you're a rich man living in a loft in a, in a high-rise apartment you have to have one of these things actually i think that's his office oh yeah you're right because they have the uh the the fucking conference tables there and Chucky has the two good guy dolls set up talking to each other. You know what happens after this? He f- when after fucking Chucky kills his ass, he, he becomes a ghost and fucking visits Bill Murray. I think that sounds about right. Uh so he kills this guy with the fucking putter, just like in Bioshock. Well, there was a moment in this involving the putter where it's like before the 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 shenanigans get underway, like we're sitting he's watching TV and I get right before he gets up to like use his little putting machine, he's like, Welp, and he just reaches behind him after Chucky had moved the putter, and it just like if that were me, I would be kind of weirded out. It's like, oh, this thing just magically appeared in my hand right where I reached. That's cool. I don't remember leaving it there. It, he was kind of—he kind of looks back. He's like, oh, that's convenient. I want to play some golf after I listen to the fucking stocks. Here I go. This is a man who takes everything for granted. Let's be honest here, okay? That's not odd to him. Chucky hits him with the putter, and he throws fucking darts at the guy, and then I think he finally just strangles him with some piano wire or some shit. No, he strangles him with a fucking yo-yo. The darts, I, I have to address. <laughs> He takes a dart to the back like it's a shotgun round. He's like, ah, 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 and just like, he can't walk. He's crawling on the ground. I'm like, dude, get up. It's a dart. Funny thing about that, I was thinking about that too. And there's a couple scenes where he's like having trouble getting up and like rubbing his back. And I literally just noticed it on this viewing. He's he, he's grunting every time he he's like bending down to get something. He clearly has like what looks like a bad back. Yeah, exactly. But a dart would not... Like, it's like, what is Chucky, a fucking expert on where the nerves and arteries are? He's like, yeah, right in the sweet spot, because I watched Pitch Black. What do you think? Yeah, well, he's maybe he's a fucking acupuncturist. You know, who knows? I mean, he hits him in the hand when he goes to grab the phone, and Chucky goes, bullseye! You think, like, Charles Lee Ray, like, when he was a human, was, like, a fucking hustler at bars and shit, like, playing darts? <laughs> I could see it. He made Mad Bank, but whoever beat him, like, he just killed in the back alley anyways. It didn't fucking matter. So you guys were talking about how uh, the scene was, like, not, like, it was very well done, wasn't very lazily done. Um, It's kind of stretched out in the book, talking about... uh, Really? Yeah. uh, We learn why they have a file on Andy on the computer. Oh, good. All right. Oh, yeah, they they, they explain that. Yeah, they uh, they followed him around. That's why we know he's in military school instead of, you know, movie magic. (laughs) Because Chucky knows how to use fucking computers in this. Apparently. But then, like, uh, his assistant walks away, and he uh, he goes in the hallway, and in the writing, this guy, Matthew Costello's the author, he writes with full sincerity, it's quiet. Too quiet. <laughs> and when I read that, I'm just like, well, all right, this is, this is the type of book I'm reading. All right, let's go. <laughs> it's Raph, a little too Raph. Yeah, it sure is. He calls his editor, how many fucking words of chapter do you need this to be? <laughs> Oh, fuck me. (laughs) All right. Just cracks his knuckles. It's going to be a long night. Okay, here it comes. Little too quiet. He just just grabs a full bottle of cough syrup and just chugs the whole thing. He's like, all right, we're doing this in one go. (laughs) Oh, my God. Could you imagine that fucking novel? He gets that concoction that they gave Daniel Stern in Bushwhack. (laughs) That is good. Here's your novel. Here's your thousand dollars, sir. I don't want to rip on the guy, but uh, this sadly was probably his most successful book. Um, He's wrote a lot of like, uh, look like murder mystery novels. I never heard of them. So I kind of feel bad for the guy. So it's okay. Two of the books mentioned in the show so far have authors I've never heard from again. Animorphs, I don't know what happened to Kay Applegate, and I sure as shit haven't heard from the person who wrote those Resident Evil books in a long time. That's fine. The thing is, they're published. That's success. You win. You won. You got paid, and so, and your book was in stores, and people buy it. Yeah, the Animorphs books are burned in my memory forever, and that Nickelodeon show can go fuck off. The sad thing is that Child's Play 3 novelization costs about $100 on Amazon right now. Wow. <laughs> Somebody get me that for Christmas. I would love that. Because it's so rare, it's not published anymore, and collectors... Oh, okay, all right, no, 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 that that makes perfect sense, because I think in, like, even the video game world, there are some games where you're like, why would you own that? It's like, because no one else does, and they're, they're obnoxiously. 
surprised. I'm a collector of horse shit, so I need that. Before we leave this scene, you know, before Chucky hops on the computer and reads fucking Andy's, uh... Psychological profile. He drops this fucking banger as he's strangling Sullivan, and he goes, Ah, nothing like a strangulation to get the circulation going. After he cracks this motherfucker in the face with the putter, he gets the line, Don't fuck with the Chuck. <laughs> Okay, that's what that line was. Okay, now I have a question about Chucky's uh, physical strength. Oh, it's it's man strength. Okay, so he's like Ant Man, where it's like his, he, like for Ant Man is like as dense as a normal sized human. Chucky retains his normal body. Right, he's just got to deal with the bullshit of being in a doll's body. Yeah, he's even got a dick apparently. But his son doesn't. Yeah. Who knows with that shit? So yeah, he finds Andy's fucking information on this computer. It's like it, it's almost like Daniel Baldwin in fucking uh, in pursuit. He just like hits the keyboard a few times and all this information <laughs> pops up for him. Man, it, it should take Chucky like ten minutes to type a full sentence because he's got these nubby little fingers. He's been dead for eight years and has never seen a computer. Yeah, like realistically, he just sits down. And he's like Andy Barclay. Here are you, you little shit. I almost said Dufresne, but that's totally in a different movie. <laughs> <laughs> he really did have a child's play redemption. Not the fucking guy who wrote the book. So we go to this school, the Kent Military School, and we come up to the gate, and they're they're playing the trumpet. They're stomping around. I guess is what military school's like, guys. I guess. The tone of the film completely changes, and it's just, for me, it's just like, I never really know how to feel about it. Even I've, I've seen this movie, uh, seriously, at least 30 times in my lifetime, but, like, I, I still just, it doesn't feel right. It feels weird. The movie hits the brakes super hard after the the office kills yeah and you're just stuck with andy like staring wide-eyed at things for 25 minutes i guess th what i was getting at before with the first and second movie is everything's a little bit more claustrophobic and it, it feels like you're trapped with this doll yeah you know what i mean whereas this is just like an open world like a big giant mansion that he's running through and it's just kind of like eh, the the, the the tension's not there. It's a big environment with lots of eyeballs and, and supervision, so, it, like, there are problems that pop up in this movie that shouldn't exist because people shouldn't behave the way they do. Exactly. Right. And a lot of decisions are made that to, to like, nerf people's intelligence just to get a scare gag over or get, like, a, tr a quick kill in because they had to fill a, a body count. Yeah, we'll get to that. I know exactly what the fuck you're talking about. I am curious, though, Smith, because uh, this, this scene opens in the movie just basically, like I said, the bus coming in, and then Andy's, you know, reintroduced as, you know, like we said previously, Justin Wayland, and he gets, like, his first talk talking to by this <laughs> Colonel Cochran. <laughs> But, like, how is this set up in the book? Is it similar, or how do they go about that? Oh, boy. Well, I got into, uh, I went to Fort Sill in Oklahoma, and uh, it was about four in the morning when we finally got our bus there. And the drill sergeants go in there immediately, start screaming at you to get the fuck off that bus. They don't show that in the movie. They just have him talking to Colonel Cochran. And I'm just like, that's not how it is. But then again, this is a military academy. But that scene with Colonel Cochran... This is one of the things I was talking about. You guys don't notice it, but he has a, a marksmanship medal. And uh, it's off-kiltered. And that shit's screaming at me so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they do that? I don't... I, I just think they don't care because, you know, it's fucking Child's Play 3. Right. There's a lot of those instances in this movie where, like, you guys don't notice it. I don't want to be super nitpicky, but at the same time, I spent... About five, six months having that shit drilled into me. Would it kill them to fucking have somebody come in and be like, hey, can you just advise on this, please? Cochran kind of tears Andy down, and, you know, Andy kind of seems like he doesn't have his heart in it, but he just has no other option. You're a troublemaker, Barkley, and we don't, I don't like troublemakers. Andy, you listen to me here. Uh, I can only talk for so long because my heart is caked in 14 layers of cholesterol. Ugh, grow up. Cut the killer doll malarkey. And who would have thought that his cholesterol-hugged heart would come back in a big way later? <laughs> <laughs> I did two tours in Nam and I put away childhood things. Now get the fuck out of my office. He did two tours in Nam behind a desk shoving Big Macs into his mouth. <laughs> oh my goodness. Had him flown in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunate son starts playing and he's just eating this McDonald's. Sir, those aren't fresh. He's like, <laughs> God damn it, don't you touch my fucking Big Mac. We had uh, we had our fair share of uh, of fat sergeants and uh, <laughs> like they're they're our superiors. I can't say anything to them, but we had one guy who who was a spitting image of Fred Flintstone. And, <laughs> and when I said that to a battle buddy, we were standing formation. We had to stay absolutely still by nudging him. I was like, Hey, 
don't he look like Fred Finstone? And we just started cackling and, uh, yeah, it didn't end well, but uh, I got a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, it was just normal getting smoked um, push-ups and stuff, but yeah, okay. they, were, they were in a hurry, so they were like, yo. You know what's funny about this is that my dad was a Marine, and his stories about his time in the service and your time at, at boot camp couldn't be any more different because he's like, yeah, this one time we laced a guy's water bottle with LSD. Jesus Christ. He's like, we came back, and he was standing on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> Was he counting the alphabet out like fucking uh, Nick Cage and Vampire's Kiss? <laughs> they said they walked in and he was just like fucking wide-eyed on his desk, like talking to things that weren't there. Holy shit, that's fucking dangerous. Ugh, so fucking, so we, so Colonel Cochran's like, get the fuck out of my office, you little bastard. And then we cut to fucking Andrew Robinson, baby. What are you doing in this movie? I, we were talking about Hellraiser and who would have known fucking Larry Cotton himself would be in this film? Yeah, what? What the fuck is he doing in here? I I lost my mind because for a second I was like, hold on, I know that. Yes, it's Kirsty's dad. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Robinson. And he's a hair fetishist? Uh, yeah. This man, he's cutting these fucking people's hair. He's like, oh yeah, baby. He's like, I'm gonna fucking shave your fucking bald and then I'm gonna fucking sniff your fucking hair later, rub it on my fucking cock. This guy's disgusting. Can we talk about the fact that he talks about, like, Presto, you're bald, and he never makes anyone bald in the movie? No. Yeah. No. Never. There there are more diverse haircuts in this movie than I was prepared for. Like, no one is bald. I was upset because I was like, I thought you were going to fucking shave Waylon down like a fucking sheep. No, you shaved into a pop star. Yeah. No, he gets that luck of the Irish haircut I was talking about. <laughs> he gets the flippy. Also that barbershop guy. So throughout the movie, he's referred to as a sir, which means he's a warrant officer. But then he's called a sergeant, which makes him a non-commissioned officer. But then someone called him a drill sergeant at another point in the movie. And again, you guys don't notice it, but I'm like, well, which fucking one is he? <laughs> this is very much like my Titanic 2 freak out over the fucking credit card. Dude, I never even noticed what they referred to him as because I did not give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was too distracted by the idea that Sean made the joke in our chat that, like, I was like, it's Kiersey's dad. And Sean's like, yeah, someone's just wearing his skin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Uncle Frank, man. It's not dad. My brain went to someone with just, like, a coat rack of just, like, Kiersey's dad and, like, Julia's skin. Like, do you want to wear a dad today? You want to go with Julia? Comes with a blue dress. Yeah, it's it's John Hurt. He fucking puts those skins on. So, uh, he's cutting Tyler's hair, and he's like, presto, you ball. Now get out of here. And he, the fucking kid, this little kid, let me tell you something you can't even have video games in school regular school what was this fucking monstrosity of a console he had it was a fucking game gear man he's playing sonic the hedgehog or some shit it looked like a sega nomad i was like why did we ever allow that thing look at it it's a weapon case in point is like what the f how the fuck is this kid carrying the shit around this military school well because he's not supposed to be there he's five years old <laughs> They hand him a fucking video game and say, go ahead and sit in the corner. We don't know what to do with you. I think there's, like, three other children in this whole movie. Here's the thing with this character. Like, I, I kind of feel bad for him because of the situation that he's put in. But just, he is so fucking annoying. And it's funny because, like, I, I was thinking about this before we recorded. And I was like, man, he just is, like, some dumb kid. And then, like, no. Andy was a dumb kid. Yeah. And he was still way smarter than this kid. This kid is just oblivious. This kid's delusional. Question. Would Chucky be easier to deal with as this child or the doll? Uh, probably as the kid, honestly. But, you know. Right? You can have him, like, incarcerated. The doll, maybe, because you're going to have Charles Lee Ray in the kid. And then that just makes him smart immediately. Yeah. Okay, so would Chucky retain his super adult strength in um in a new body i think he would just get the memory at that point yeah i think he's just as strong as a five-year-old it never happens so i guess we don't really know yeah yeah we don't know but like it let's let's say he didn't keep that fucking that super strength he has and he gets this kid's like just spaghetti body like how useful would he be he's a fucking child at that point who gives a fuck because he's like a seven-year-old and he can just go to the gym and he has to relive his whole life <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't think he gives a shit. But that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Why would he start working out when he's seven? Like He's like, oh, yeah, fresh start. Well, I'm just saying, he could. But, like, he would just use the fact of, like, being a kid to, like, fool people, you know? I think you guys are thinking about this way more than the script writers were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if he got into Tyler, he could just change bodies again if he wanted to or or like i said he could just you know live his life as this kid and as he you know aptly puts it later in the movie to andy he's gonna be a bro man oh fuck me in the book he says chuck is gonna be a bro 
bitchin'. The idea of Chucky saying the word bitchin' just is never going to leave my head. It's like Freddy saying that or or something. Like, I just don't... I It's... Okay. The fucking wisecracks in this film, way over the line. Yeah. Like, it's in the first and second film. I would say, it's, it's, it's funny I mentioned Freddy vs. Jason in the beginning of this because he has that one line at the end of that movie where he says, how sweet dark meat when he's looking at Kelly Rowland. I was like, no! It's just like, you don't need it. The movie already has so much else going on. I accept Freddy as a child murderer, but I'll be damned if he's a racist. <laughs> he doesn't discriminate. So we go to Andy, and he has, you know, he's in his room, he's got this guile haircut, and he's fucking, you know, unpacking his shit. <laughs> he's fucking Sonic booming all over the place. He's unpacking his stuff, and, and he sees this closet start to shake, and, he, and he's got, like, PTSD. Because uh, right before this, when he was getting his hair cut, there was, like, a commercial for the good guy dolls coming back, and he was, like, really freaked out by that. And Tyler was like, wow, I can't wait to fucking get one of those. And well, it's good, too, because it sets up the whole idea that clearly this kid, much like Andy when he was a kid, wants this doll. Because they're both lonely children? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that whole angle works for me for Tyler, but the actor just sucks. Right. So yeah, Andy's in his room and his closet's shaking, so he's freaked, but uh, he opens it and, uh, surprise, it's not Chucky this time, it's his fucking roommate. Whitehurst. Whitehurst, it seems he's the only fucking nerd in this whole joint. It seems like. And he just gets fucked with constantly by, like, everybody. Yeah, the rest of his, like, square-jawed fucking idiots who are all just shout military commands, and that's their personality. They all fucking talk like this, and they're like, oh, fucking Whitehurst. He goes to Andy, he's explaining, yeah, you know, uh, Shelton did this to me. And let me see if I can get this guy's fucking title right. Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Brett C. Shelton? Asshole. Don't forget that. This fucking shit-stained guy who thinks he's the drill sergeant for the whole platoon, I guess. Yeah, I want to add something here. This guy would have gotten soaped so hard in the middle of the night that Shelton, because (laughs) you're a fucking PG, man. You're a platoon guide. Your job is to sing cadences to us while we go to the chow hall. That is your job. It's not to fucking do whatever this guy did. You say soaped, and I'm assuming you mean fill a pillowcase full of soap and beat someone with it? Absolutely. We never (laughs) did that. We never did that, but we had a moment where I was with a guy and I said, listen, I'm not saying we're going to do that to him, but I am saying I got 20 bars of soap in my locker. (laughs) I'm not saying we will, but we should. This fucking guy, man. I'm glad to hear that because this dude's fucking uh, reprehensible and, and his... His comeuppance isn't as satisfying as it should be because he's a piece of shit. He does get it pretty good, though. He does, but I was kind of hoping his fate and somebody else's were swapped. Mm. But, uh, yeah, he's a piece of piece of shit who, uh, he kind of looks like, um, Sid from Toy Story. Yeah, a little bit. Oh my god, he does. Well, he's got all the kids out there, you know, it's like the next day. Yeah. And they're all out there in their uniforms, and they're lined up like it's like, you know, the, the moment before a big fucking battle in a Lord of the Rings movie. He's, like, going over their uniforms and shit. Yeah, they're, he's, like, fucking got them all lined up and he's like I, I i is it the first day of school no it's actually in the middle of the semester at least i think that was according to the book it was like in the middle okay i don't even know what you want to call them all the adult type kids all the older kids are outside like all of them and then tyler's just sitting there yeah what the fuck they said if i came outside i'd get a popsicle but there's other little kids in this place there's like a handful of them he just kind of goes wherever the script director told him to go and you know that's where he sat. Go over there. Go sit over there. Wait for Chucky. Okay, thank you. Tyler, no, don't. You're not in the seat. You're in the scene. Okay, just sit there. That's fine. Just give him his fucking game gear. Give him the extra long battery. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all lined up, and uh, Shelton's walking around staring everybody down, and um, he picks out fucking Andy because Andy's like, looking around all nervous and shit, and he's like, oh, you, Andy, you must be the goddamn new boy. And he's like, you like it here or what? And he's and he's like, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty good. And he's like, did I tell you you can fucking look at me, you little piece of shit? And he just starts fucking going off on him. He calls him a dipweed. Dipweed, fucking asshole. He called him a nimrod. I was like, that's a word I haven't heard in a long time. Oh, no, that was Whitehurst. He called Whitehurst a nimrod. Yeah, he's like, that's Lieutenant Colonel Shelton, asshole. Get it right or pay the price. Lieutenant Colonel Jar- General Sergeant Captain Admiral something Gunner Sergeant Shelton. I'm not even supposed to be doing this. I've got medals I haven't earned and titles I don't have. I have no idea what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you have this the, the one female character, uh, Kristen De Silva, is kind of off to the side and she's like, What an asshole. And he's like, What? Huh? What? And he like, he marches over. He's like, Can you repeat what you just said? She's like, 
yeah, you're being an asshole. And he's like, ah! He's like, he's like, if we weren't in front of a bunch of people, I'd smack the shit out of you. He's like, a girl, no, my only weakness. He's the type of guy that'll sit there and say, yeah, you know, women, they want equal rights, but then when we give them to her, they just complain. <laughs> oh, he's totally that guy. He even does it in the scene. He's like, you know, just because you're so goddamn delicate, you think we're going to take it easy on you, but not today. Nope. So De Silva does like 25 push-ups and then the like the last three with one hand. And even this dude's like, oh shit. Yeah, he's afraid. He's shaking in his britches. Come here, White Hearse. I'm gonna bother the little Jewish kid. Yeah, well, this girl's uh, before a very impressive physical feat, so I'm gonna knock her glasses off. <laughs> Pretty much. Shot my shoes, fucker. All the adults just stand there and say, All right, uh, Shelton, uh, enough. Like, come on already. And he's like, Oh, 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 okay. Doesn't actually happen, but I was kind of waiting for it. Actually, there aren't a lot of adults in this academy. No. There's like three. You have have the 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 warrant officer sergeant drill sergeant barber guy and then you have colonel cochran and then you have this command sergeant major later on in the movie and that's kind of it yeah yeah and at some point i was starting to think that this place was kind of like the fake college from accepted i'm like is this just a scam being run by a couple like redneck kids and their uncles <laughs> It's a shadow company. It's Trump University. That's the real uh, secret. <laughs> oh. There's an umbrella lab underneath it. Oh, my God. You think? All right. Makes sense. Clones of Mike Pence are under there, just in fucking tubes. Just in case we need them. <laughs> Shelton is Wesker. Wesker's dead because he was the fucking pilot in Titanic 2, remember? <laughs> Or no, he was the, the ship captain. He went down with that shit. We get this scene with fucking Tyler going to the mailroom, and he gets the news. Oh, did I get any letters from my dad? And this uh, this uh, the other adult, the guy that works in the mailroom, he uh, is like, ah, oh, yeah, no, nothing, Tyler. But I got this package for Andy. He's new. Can you uh, deliver it? And it's, like, so fucking obvious it's the fucking good guy in a box. To us. Who wrapped this? Who wrapped Chucky in the box? Did Chucky, like, leave a fucking note for somebody? Like, could you imagine this scene? So you walk in, right, and this fucking guy is strangled on the floor. The CEO of this fucking company is dead. Right. And then what is there? Like a little note in his hand that says, please deliver this good guy to Andy Barkley at the fucking military academy? Yeah, did, did Chucky box himself? But how if he did? I'm also just thinking of like Chucky like, trying to like box himself and he's just like, I should have had this guy do this for me before I killed him. <laughs> <laughs> this kid's carrying this fucking Chucky box around and he keeps getting bullied people keep knocking out of his fucking hands and then eventually it just like rips in one corner and you can just see the good guy logo and he's like whoa and then he steals a package from somebody yeah he has like a shit attack he's like oh my god a good guy I can't wait to open this even though it's not addressed to me I'm just gonna go and open it what did you think was gonna happen dude that's a federal offense Tyler oh yeah and you're at a military school even Chucky says that he's like don't you know to tamper with the mail's a federal offense fuck face I'm calling the government on you he gets him down in like this basement or what have you and Chucky literally just jumps out of the fucking package Tyler's like yeah <laughs> yeah, not scared at all. He's like, wow, never saw a doll like you before. And Chucky's like, oh, there's several points where Chucky is very clearly like, it, it, he like, he might as well have a neon above him that says, I'm going to kill you. And Tower's like, come on, come find me. Come on, Charles. It's 1991. What kind of technology do you think is out there where this doll can just move around and think on its own like that? The saddest thing about this whole thing is that Tyler outranks me. What? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> He's a private first class. I'm a private E2. He outranks me. Nobody thought about this. This kind of perspective on an episode is so fucking fascinating. I love this. What Now, now what, what qualified you for either of those things? Just time of service, pretty much. Okay. Uh, I got ranked up, actually, because of uh, college credits, because... The military right now is trying to enlist people with like, oh, if you went to college, you know, we'll give you a higher paycheck and rank you up. So in basic training, I had people like who were like corporals already. Wow. Specialists. Yeah. So hypothetically, Smith, how long would it take you to gain the same rank as Tyler? A year and a half of service for Tyler. Uh, for me, it would have been six months if I didn't do the college credit thing. So this kid was theoretically just fucking dropped off of this place when he was like five. <laughs> <laughs> Better hit the books. I got to get my E2. That's like when they give like 10 year olds black belts. Yeah. They're like, yep, you completed your karate. He's a black belt. They're like, we were going to put him in the Boy Scouts, but he's like 
been dropped here by his parents at the military school for years with no letters. So we just kind of felt bad. He's going to be a colonel by the time he's fucking 12. So so Chucky pops out of the box and he's like, ah, where the fuck's Andy? He's supposed to get this package. He's like, I wanted to play with a good guy because I'm lonely or whatever. And then Chucky has like this realization where he's like, ah, wait a second. I got a new body and I haven't told anybody I'm Charles Lee Ray. Here I go. He realizes that he could just do it to this kid instead of Andy. And he is just, uh, he's fucking thrilled because this kid's an easy mark. Oh, yeah, he's fucking stupid. He's like, I want to play the soul out of body game with you. And Tyler's like, okay. <laughs> Hide the soul. I think the biggest thing uh, to take away from this movie for me was that I don't think Chucky really knows his own religion's rules. I mean, if you consider this a religion. Right. Oh, it's straight up voodoo, like Dumbala and everything. Well, actually, the book goes into a lot of uh, background, actually, about Dumbala, surprisingly. Really? Yeah. Uh, so Charles actually was just like a petty crook, and then he met this shaman and was like, I'll give you some magic here. You won't get hurt by bullets. And then he's just like, I want to meet Dumbala. And then in the book, it's like, yeah, Dumbala's your your typical Lovecraftian monster. If you look at him, you'll go mad and whatever. And here's a bunch of tongue imagery and weird shit. He's like a serpent, right? No, some kind of a bunch of heads, some tongues. Like It's just like... Like if you, it, I don't want to call the guy a lazy writer, but it's it's like Lovecraft where it's like undescribable. Yeah, and it's like, well, you're not giving me anything to work with. I can't imagine anything in my head. Like I'm not even imagining like a black mass. I'm just imagining nothing. This is that's so weird. Why do they? What? How? How does that? transition what does he like tell is chucky like telling tyler this like how does it how does that work in the book uh no it's all flashbacks the thing about like novelizations that you get into people's heads and hear them thinking oh gotcha like uh like back at the barber shop andy thought the barber was a lot like edward scissorhands but and i quote the book edward scissorhands wasn't an asshole <laughs> Wow. Yeah, because that guy's like touching everyone's fucking hair and everything. This is like creepy pasta shit. I was gonna say I'd be really into the idea of a movie just about like human Charles running around trying to find a way to be immortal and coming across this this voodoo priest. Yeah, the first movie. Yeah, and then one well, no, like a whole movie, like <laughs> like a prequel. No, yeah, like no, like the doll thing is at the very end. Like just like the, his life as a serial killer, and then the idea that he wants to be everlasting. Maybe we're gonna get some of that in this remake. So the thing is in the book. Um, it kind of turns out that he just becomes a strangler to, like, sacrifice, uh, like, victims to Dumbala. He pretty much was just a petty crook. And then he's just like, I want more power. And just start sacrificing people by strangling them. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, see, I'm kind of into that. I mean, whereas in this, it's like clear by this point that he just likes doing it. I like that better. Don tries to fuck around with that in Curse of Chucky, and it goes for good for, like, a little while, and then totally shits the bed in the third act. But anyway, because we got to tie all the fucking shitty movies that came before it together, so here we are. Yeah, so Chucky, he has his fucking hand on this kid's head, and he's doing the incantation that he did in the first two movies. And much like in the first two, you, it does a you know cutaway to the whole building, and all these dark clouds are coming in, and starts fucking lightning coming down. And uh, Cochran and another guy come in and interrupt him, and Chucky's fucking pissed. And he, and he curses, and uh, this kid goes, Oh, Charles, watch your mouth! <laughs> yeah, he's called him Charles. Yeah, and then uh, Cocker and everybody walk over. They're like, what the hell are you doing here? He's like, oh, I gotta go sit down. My heart's gonna implode. He's like, God damn it. Tom, we don't, we don't play with dolls here. Dolls are for girls. Yeah, we don't play with dolls. They're for girls. He's like, clean your shit up. I'll take care of the doll. And then he's like, no, but he's my friend, and he's Charles Lee Ray, and he wants to kill me. He's the Lakeshore Strangler, okay? Cochran's like, poppycock. What a bunch of malarkey. Give me this doll. Uh, so he, he carries this, this fucking doll out, and Andy's out there with his platoon getting harassed and doing his, you know... I, I don't what are these even called just drills it's a drill cadences um marching uh there's another name for it I, I forgot I was a terrible soldier I thought they were just like drills right or is that not the same thing it's pretty much yeah um they're doing uh basic marching formations uh working with our rifles we did those a couple times and I, I still know the formations but god forbid you have me try to remember the terminology well Shelton will fucking remind you the terminology, okay? Oh, yeah. We're fucking doing this rifled thing, and uh, Andy sees the colonel fucking carrying Chucky to the dumpster and fucking has a shit attack and drops his uh, rifle. And uh, Shelton's like, God damn it, Mark Lee, like, fall out, jerk off. And he's like, he's like, the hell's wrong with you? you? Ain't got a gun. It's not a goddamn baton. What are you, a fucking major ed or some shit? And he's just like, uh, sorry, man, I'm not used to guns. He's like, gun? He's like, this is a goddamn rifle. Come here. That is a very real thing. 
It is not a gun. Oh, yeah. And then we get the fucking dude who comes over and he's like, I don't know what the fucking guy's name is. So I'm going to call him Gorman. Gorman, come over here and show Mr. Barkley what a rifle is. And the guy's like, this is my rifle. This is my gun. Holds his fucking dick. This is for shooting and this is for fun. Then we get this Chucky doll get thrown in the back of a fucking dumpster. And I felt so bad for this garbage man. <laughs> This poor fucker. Yeah, this is awful. <laughs> so this is another one of those things where it's like, we take forever to kill integral people, whereas in the first two films, we're killing people that are actual characters. Right, now now we're just killing secondary, tertiary. Okay, and that's what I mean. Like, this movie, you, you've said the fact that, like, he has a time frame, and he has to do this, you know, in a certain time window, but he's very, he's like, oh, well, you know, whatever, I can just take a minute and kill this garbage man who has no effect on my plan whatsoever and I could just easily escape but I'm gonna stop and kill him for reasons like I get he's a serial killer but he's also goal oriented he's constantly working against his own mission like there's time for that later well I think he was about to get crushed so he starts screaming he does and then the guy stops the, the garbage truck and he's like oh my god oh my god dude I laughed so hard I forgot when he gets dumped into the back of the garbage truck he goes shit and he fucking falls <laughs> out of the garbage <laughs> into the garbage truck also did Uncle Frank summon this fucking garbage truck from the Cenobites cause <laughs> when we go inside what the the fuck why is this thing a dude this is a saw trap there's like this rotating fucking uh uh roller with like fucking spikes on it it looks like something out of labyrinth if that's what was in the truck shredder fell into there's no way he would have fucking gotten out of that thing yeah and what about Ernest when he got compacted he would have got fucking fucked up from this thing yeah it would have spat out pulp it's like a torture dump truck <laughs> well this guy goes in to save this screaming person and uh, Chucky laughs about it as he escapes out of the back and just crushes this poor fucking guy. And uh, I guess his screams are loud enough that the platoon hears him and Andy and all them run over? His screams from inside a giant metal box resonate across an entire piece of property. So they don't hear Chucky screaming, but they hear this guy screaming. I guess between that and the combination of his bones being crushed loudly? I guess. I don't know. Shelton smelled blood? I don't know. It, again, it's just one of those things It's like, how can we up the body count? Let's kill this fucking garbage man well no it's been a certain amount of time since the last murder so we have to get one in here if you're gonna get bored but fun fact i was already bored uh, again there's like no weight to it it's just like oh I happenstance death you know yeah cool that person i didn't care about who was on screen for two seconds got killed by a garbage truck i cared about him <laughs> i want all of john the garbage man's backstory like he has like two white like a wife and two kids see that would have been something the novel could have worked on they could have totally did that in the novel like as the man's getting crushed it would just like talk about like and as john the garbage man was about to be pulverized he thought about his wife and two kids and his little dog skip and how they were supposed to go for a picnic later that day and then darkness so uh yeah he kills the garbage man and chucky escapes and just, uh i don't remember where he goes from this point he goes all mad eye moody he hides in fucking andy's uh trunk <laughs> He's like, <laughs> yeah, he's in fucking Andy's room in a trunk, and Andy comes back and he's hanging out with fucking Whitehurst. He's like, "What are you doing, Whitehurst?" He's like, "I'm fucking polishing Shelton's shoes. What does it look like I'm doing?" <laughs> he does spit in the shoes, so I give him that credit. Yeah, it's like his one fuck you to the guy that he'll never know about. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I I shine his shoes, but I use my own spit. <laughs> I fucking loogied in him. Yeah, but uh, Whitehurst, you still sat there for an hour doing it. Yeah, but you know, but I'm, uh, I'm sticking it to him. Shelton gets the shoes and he's like, "Is this spit?" And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Go back and." peeing them like I asked. <laughs> Where's my fucking Duke shoes I wanted? Yeah, where, why ain't you shitting them? <laughs> he's like, w are, are you serious right now, Sheldon? He's like, what do you think? I'm a fucking moron? No, I'm not serious. Do 20 push-ups. One-handed. He's like, ah. <laughs> With your dick. Dick-ups. Put your hand on your dick. Do it now. Hold that gun. <laughs> Oh God! So Whitehurst leaves, and uh, we see we see uh, you know like I said we see Chucky go in that trunk, but then Andy goes to put some stuff in there, and uh oh he's gone. Switcheroo! And uh, Chucky's like under the bed, and I don't I don't understand this scene. Me neither. He has this fucking knife, and he swipes at Andy's foot like at his ankle because Andy's sitting on the bed. He slits his fucking Achilles heel. Yeah, but he just kind of falls over, and he's not hurt at all. There's no wound on him. Did he miss? Why did he fall over? I don't, maybe he scared him, but like, at that, I don't know, like, but he doesn't actually cut him either. Now, in the book, is that explicit? Does he actually get cut there? Is, it, is that actually explained? It's pretty much the same as the movie. He just kind of gets cut, and then we just forget about it. If you get your fucking Achilles tendon severed, you're, you're not walking. 
Like you're just not. Well, it's, it doesn't matter because that this is where Chucky drops that that really tasteless bro line. Yeah. And then Andy just decides, ah, it's fucking. It's like Connor's been saying. It's just a fucking doll, and he grabs Shelton's shoe and he just starts beating the shit out of Chucky with it. Yeah. And then Shelton walks in for some reason. Well, yeah, because he he hears all the banging and he's like, hey, 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 you're hitting that doll with my fucking shoes, man. <laughs> <laughs> he heard his shoes fly through the fucking air. Yeah, his shoe sense went off. It's like a dad with a the thermostat. Somebody touched. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He's using his shoe to beat the shit out of the doll. So he takes his shoes back, threatens uh, Andy, basically saying, "Now he has to fucking clean his shoes." And he just takes the doll first, just because, just like as a fuck you. Sheldon takes this fucking scumbag, dirt riddled, fucking sloppy doll and says, "Yeah, got my my kid sister's birthday's coming up. Gonna give her this fucking doll." I'm like, what? That's the Scott. It's like this. It's shit ridden. It was in the garbage. It probably smells like garbage. I, I don't like her too much. And I, I don't want to spend any money on her. So. I, they don't let us out much. So doll for her from the fucking garbage. Andy, of course, you know, he knows it's Chucky at this point. So he gets in his fucking uh, Needlemeyer gear. He gets his fucking Hamburglar costume on. And he's like going through the. <laughs> he's walking around the halls trying to sneak around like a creep. And uh, he easily gets into Shelton's fucking. Uh, bunk i suppose yeah his room so shelton has an entire wall of weapons and i'm looking at this thing and be like no 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 <laughs> a fucking bowie knife like crocodile dundee uh, i think like an m4 grand rifle on there too like it just it, is he prepared for a fucking graboid to come through the wall or something like <laughs> well it's like that or like what is this military school doing what they what it is like a school for like prepping mass shooters like why is this allowed like our rifles were always locked away always it's like they just said hey shelton uh we got no rooms left so you're gonna get the men in black gun room <laughs> Don't press the button. He masturbates to that wall of weapons every night. So Andy sneaks in his room, and he's like, oh, he's sleeping. Okay. He, and he fucking opens the closet, and uh, Chucky's not in there. But then he looks at this fucking wall of weapons, and the Bowie knife is missing? And, like, there's, like, complete with, like, a shadow of where it was, just so the viewers know what it looks like. And he's, like, kneeling by Shelton's bed, and he's about to look underneath the bed, and fucking Chucky comes up behind him, he's like, hey, Andy, scares the shit out of him, and he jumps onto a sleeping Shelton, and, like, they, like, wrestle in his bed for a second, and then, like, he throws Andy up against the wall, and he's like, what the fuck you doing in here, goddammit, and he's like, he's like, oh, it's the doll, man, I need the doll, it's Chucky, or whatever. Right after this, he makes them run these fucking laps in front of the uh, place, in, in front of the bunker, and it's, like, fucking raining out. Because somebody took the doll. And there's knife. He doesn't know where the knife is, either. But nobody took the doll. The Chucky ran out of the room, and he's like, where the fuck's the doll, Barkley? And he's like, I didn't take it. And he's like, well, somebody took it. Everybody out fucking running laps. So, actually, the, the book, that scene in the bedroom was a lot different, where Chucky was actually, like, up against Shelton with the Bowie knife by his neck, and it was like a little standoff. It was actually kind of intense. Oh, wow. Oh, all right. Can you break that down a little bit? I want to hear this. Uh, basically, Andy comes in with the knife, and Chucky obviously has a bigger knife. Now, this is a knife. How the fuck he didn't say it in this movie, I don't know. But go on. Uh, and it was just like a, a big old standoff, where it was like Andy was contemplating, like, if I try to get him now, he slices Tyler's, uh, Sheldon's throat. Uh, like, you know, he'd go to jail and stuff. Like, it was actually kind of intense. Wait a minute, that, that scene would reframe the entire story, because then, at, from that point forward, Shelton knows the doll's alive. Well, no, Shelton was sleeping. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Because it was, I was gonna say, that would, that would create serious plot holes if that was the case, where Shelton just fucking forgets, like... But you know what it would create is, like, some actual tension, because, yeah. like, kind of what Smith is saying there, it would be good, because Chucky, at this point, like, he doesn't want Andy to fuck his shit up because he's just a problem now. So if he has this leverage on him, like, hey, you know, I'm gonna take Tyler's fucking body, and if you try to stop me, I'm just gonna start picking people off, like... And he can't really do anything because everyone's just going to assume he's killing people again. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh, that would have made this whole scene way more compelling if he was like, yeah, I'm going to kill him. And then he's like, you know, you're going to go to fucking jail or whatever. Like, they're going to blame it on you. Like, fucking with him. So they're getting smoked outside in the middle of the night, which, you know, I'm fucking jealous because they get to wear their ponchos. We never got to wear our fucking ponchos. <laughs> Get out of here and run laps, but it's raining. So put your coats on so you're warm. <laughs> Holding the fucking rifles above their heads, I guess. We want you to be comfortable. You're never comfortable. You're never comfortable in basic, ever. I did it during winter, man, and uh, whew, I never want to be that cold again, man. Actually, you know who got to wear our ponchos? Our fucking rucksacks. We were ordered not to get them wet, but we, we could be soaked as much as they wanted. <laughs> and all they had to do was run in this movie? Bullshit. <laughs> 
<laughs> but only for an hour. Cochrane says one hour only. Yeah. At a very leisurely pace, in a circle, like, it, it's, I don't know, make him run a few miles or something. It's something else. Like, it was like, all right, jog calmly. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, push it. Andy on the ground because he's a piece of shit. You feel bad about yourselves now? I'm trying to weed out this thief, Colonel. We'll get everybody inside in an hour. Okay, let's make it real tough. Hold them fucking rifles up higher. It's a fucking doll that y'all want to throw in the garbage anyway. Who cares? That's a big problem with me because... This doll just gets more dirtier and shittier as the movie goes on, and it's like, it's such a fucking garbage thing. Why would you want to keep it or give it to somebody? Yeah, because, you know, Andy, even though it's pretty much his fault that they're doing this, he just magically runs off. No one stops him immediately. Shelton's like fucking solid snake. He's hiding in the shadows. Oh, what is up with that? Pops out of a fucking cardboard box. He asks Whitehurst, he's like, where do the kids sleep? I gotta go find Tyler because Chucky's gonna get him. And he's like, over there. Uh, so yeah, he gets caught immediately and then cut to Chucky basically, you know, casually, you know, walking around with this Bowie knife towards, you know, where Tyler's uh, supposedly sleeping. And Tyler leaves a fucking note on the door for Charles. A note in his bed. Come find me. Hide and seek. Your best friend. And Chucky's just like, what the fuck? He was fucking legitimately pissed off. Well, this kid, he's like, he's playing hide and seek, you know, with uh, Charles, and uh, he's not, he, he's doing a horrible job. He's like running around, looking around behind him. He's going from door to door. Chucky's just casually walking and listening, like, all right, he's, he's down there, I guess. Okay. I'm over here, Charles. Yeah. He goes in the fucking closet of Cochran's office. Of all the places. Well, you know, all three adults are out of the building, so. <laughs> Cochran being one of them. Cochran's like asleep somewhere and everybody else is outside. He's just passed out in a pile of Baconator boxes. <laughs> Just a fucking sauce hanging off his chin. He wakes up because he hears De Silva and uh, her friend and a few other people like fucking looking around in his office, I guess, for Andy's file. Yeah, De Silva's got the hots for Andy. She's like, oh my God, he's so hot and fucking broken. I'm going to fix him. And she like, <laughs> she, like, they go in there looking for his file. She's rummaging through this thing and she's looking at him and uh, his file and she's like, yes, psychiatric ward. Yeah. No wonder he's so quiet. And she's about to, like, unveil the fucking, you know, the, the clipping of, like, child blames killings on Killer Doll or whatever. But right before that, she's, like, disturbed by um Tyler in the fucking closet fucking around with Chucky in there. Like, what were they doing? He's probably doing that damn incantation. But they would have hurt him, right? Well, I think he had just got caught up to him at that point. So, you know, he came in moments before they did. Chucky's, like, goes to start and this girl's walking in. He's like, mm! God damn it. Like, at that point, wouldn't he just, like, slaughter them and then just fucking do the incantation and then bounce? See, that makes, that makes more sense to me than, like, every other victim in the movie where he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna lollygag and just, like, you know, rack up my personal body count. Pretty much. They they take the doll out of the closet, like, they grab Tyler, and then De Silva is, like, for some reason decides to put lipstick on him? Yeah, he's like, that's my friend Charles Lee Ray, don't do that. <laughs> just telling everyone, you ever hear the Lakeshore Strangler? That's him! It's like saying, this is like, I have a doll, and I go like, don't do that, that's Ted Bundy, leave him alone. Yeah. He could jump out of a third story window and be okay. <laughs> He's going out the library. They put lipstick on him, and then they, like, leave because they hear somebody coming, and they have to leave the doll there. And Chucky, like, sits up, like, man, he's got some of the worst fucking lines in this movie. Because he, like, sits up and, like, wipes the lipstick off, and he's like, he's like, oh, this means war. And I'm like, eh, didn't need that. His quippage, like, all of his, like, one-liners, they feel like someone in this, in this script just wrote and then he quips like there's there's no <laughs> there's no like he just says very like duke nukem-esque uh one-liners brad dorf just like all right this direction you want me to go in what do you want me to say exactly uh you know just kind of make it up brad and he's like uh okay uh give me one second he's like reading like the previous scene he's like okay something about lipstick uh th this means war uh, okay, Brad, great job. And the director's like, but you have to say this one. Chucky's gonna be a bro. You have to say that one. Also, don't fuck with the Chuck. That came from the producers. You gotta say it. <laughs> we gotta sell fucking t-shirts. Come on. When uh, when novelizations get made, uh, they pretty much just follow a early draft of the script. So these lines were, they, they survived the writing process, the producer process, the actor reading them and everything. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So don't fuck with the Chuck. Chucky's gonna be a bro. They took out bitchin' because that was the bad part of that line. That crossed the line, bitchin'? Bitchin' crossed the line, apparently. 
<laughs> and this means war was apparently good enough too to keep the whole process. Fucking farts all around for that one because it's like what? So Cochran he comes in as all these kids leave and they leave Chucky behind, and he's kind of looking at the doll like, well, "What the fuck? I threw this thing away." Must be all them goddamn burgers. And then Ch- Chucky s- springs to life real quick, and like he has his fucking knife out and he's screaming. Yeah, yeah, he does that Brad Dourif uh, guttural uh, primal shout. <laughs> Cochran has an instant heart. <laughs> And then Quip, fucking, Chucky's like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And this guy, and I said the same thing, because this guy falls through his fucking, like, display of, like, war uh, toys and dies. I kind of love this, because it's, like, an old guy who just, like, he's like, holy shit, talking doll, and just fucking drops. (laughs) Well, and they take the body bag out. And no offense to this guy, but there's no way he was fitting in the body bag they brought out. No way. Also, with that dodgy heart, I don't think he served two tours in Nam. Yeah, Shelton's standing there fucking wiping a tear away. Two terms in Nam, and he, he just dies like this. It just doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. He's like fucking how old, and the man is one fucking burger away from a goddamn heart attack. Yeah, we all know his history with burgers. <laughs> Again, the, the Chucky in tandem with the Baconator fucking binge <laughs> caused his death. So I talked about one good thing that the book did versus the movie the movie here kind of framed it to make it like a PTSD thing where like he's screaming a tiny human with a knife light flickering looks like nom oh yeah okay in the book it just kind of happens like the heart attack just kind of happens Chucky just kind of standing there in the hallway with a knife and he's like the Cochran's just like a knife a doll what what is this feeling in my arm and then just fucking goes (laughs) are you serious yeah that's fucking stupid Stupid. It's like the hatchet, the fucking, he just, he's flying a plane and just crashes it into the wilderness. He's like narrating the whole thing. He's like a doll, a knife, my arm. I smell almonds. Good night. And I have died. <laughs> <laughs> but they kept, you gotta be fucking kidding me. They kept that line. <laughs> oh. You know, Brad Dorf, he already recorded it in the booth, so, you know. Can't alter that. (laughs) Usually... He ain't coming back to do reshoots. Usually what happens is it's already pre-recorded, and then Brad Dorf doesn't have a say in it. He just has to re-say the lines again. Yeah. Like somebody says it on set to make the puppet talk. So the next morning, we have this fucking mess hall where Shelton, again, put in some major leader fucking position for whatever reason, is giving... Like, tells the other people there in this military academy to just start praying. Andy can't fucking take it because, you know, he knows it was Chucky. So he goes to get up, and Whitehurst is like, dude, you can't just get up during mess. And, uh, of course, he trips. So- somebody trips his ass. I guess you can, bye. Well, see ya. He fucking goes over to Tyler, and he's like... He's like, he's like, you, you, did you see Chucky? He's like, no. He's like, yes, you did. He's like, yeah, well, I saw him last night. And then, uh, you know, Andy's like, you gotta stay away from him. He's a bad guy. And Tyler's like, you're just jealous because he's not your best friend anymore and he's mine. And at that point, Andy should have just fucking smacked this little bastard and just was like, you know what? Fuck you. Y- you know what? He's your problem now. Yeah, enjoy. I mean, he knows he's going to be Tyler anyway. When did he could just fucking let Tyler get possessed. And then off him. Fuck it. So during this scene, uh, Sergeant Larry Cotton comes in and he's he's fucking fondling everybody's hair. <laughs> he's fucking smelling it and shit. Yeah, sticking his face in there. He he go basically he says, uh, Whitehurst, uh, you're due for a haircut. And so we go from this scene to basically Whitehurst getting his haircut finished. And uh, you know, he's 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 cut down, he balded him up. Let's say. It looks exactly the same. Yeah. Presto, you're bald. Presto, you're bald, and they're, they're never bald. He never makes him bald. Nope. No, never. Presto, you got a shape up. The fucking barber's just going blind and just want to admit it. And he's like, Presto, bald. Everyone's like, but they're not. He's like, shh. No, no, no. His eyes are failing. You don't want to talk about it. That's my catchphrase. Don't fuck it up. Here's my thing with the scene. Okay, Whitehurst gets a haircut and leaves. Why is Chucky just there? Just because I guess they wanted this character to get fucking killed? This is where I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me with this. This is what Connor and I were talking about before when it was like, okay, we just have him there strictly to up this body count. Because there's no reason to kill this dude. Smith, how the fuck does Chucky end up in this barber shop? He's just there, man. Okay. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh. Don't bullshit me, dude. The novelization couldn't be bothered either. Later on, uh, there's actually a really good uh, aspect they added. But yeah, in this part, it's just, he's just freaking there, man. He's in a fucking cabinet. Yep. And, uh... Uncle Frank goes in there to fucking get some kind of aftershave or something, and he falls out, and he's like, what the hell are you doing in there, little thing? Okay, this is also the second part of the scene that was driving me bonkers, because the the grown-ups in this movie act, like, so out of their own better interests and in ways that no human being would act. Like, 
you've got, like first of all, what kind of academy would hire this loony bin? Oh, he's a he's a lunatic for sure. He this guy's fucking out of his mind because he he sees this doll and then he's like, <laughs> and then just like puts it on the barber chair and he's like, I'm gonna scalp this doll. Like what's speaking of nobody's looking? That haircut ain't regulation, soldier. Yeah, like it's some, imagine somebody like. Who wasn't a child who walked in just stirred, like caught this particular moment? It's like, um, is this what happens? Why do you have a doll and why are you cutting its hair? Was he gonna have the buzzer in one hand and be jacking off with the other? Like, what was his plan here? <laughs> he might as well be. Speaking of non regulation haircuts, um, his is in regulation in the barbershop, but like barely. Like, he has pretty much like the the minimum that he can have. If his, if his hair is any longer, he's gonna have to cut off some pieces. And. I'm watching the movie, and every every female cadet has their hair down. It's all prettied up. Yeah, the silver too. Like she she like shows it off to the barber. Like he can't do shit to me. And I'm like, no, he can because that's out of regulation. You should have that shit in a bun. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I was saying. The one the one chick has a fucking perm, and it's all teased out at one point. Again, I don't know if this is because it's a military academy. It's like you know loosened. Uh, regulations, whatever, but it, it it's screaming at me, man. Yeah. No, I get you. Well, I think the problem, as we mentioned before, is that this movie tells you it's at a military academy, but also wants to be like boot camp and is, is just as aggressive and as hard as that, but it probably shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah. So, Chucky, I guess, what does he grab? Some kind of... Uh... A straight razor. He gives him the old Sweeney Todd and fucking slits his throat. He's like, meat pies! Oh, what does he say again? Presto, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God. And then its follow-up is even better because Uncle Frank's dying in the fucking mirror, and Chucky's just like, oh, it's definitely you. Well, then Whitehurst comes back because I guess he forgot something and sees Chucky there. He forgot his bag. Like, they, <laughs> they had to mention that in the book, yeah. He, Chucky's standing there, like, this guy's, like, sliced open on the fucking barber chair, and he's, like, talking to Whitehurst, and Whitehurst just runs out, and then, mind you, he runs back out, and the platoon's all set up to do this capture the flag fucking game, even though Cochran was just found murdered. Well, it's in honor of Cochran. And uh, Whitehurst doesn't find it you know, important to mention that he just found the barber with his neck sliced open with a fucking talking doll back there? The talking doll was one thing, because you don't want to sound crazy, yeah. but you just saw a man die, and you're like, yeah, I should keep this to myself. Uh, yeah. Also, just real quick, the last shot of this, like, before Whitehurst runs upstairs, Uncle Frank, I keep calling him Uncle Frank, but uh, the barber's, like, dead in the chair, and then you see Chucky, and he's holding a buzz, the, one of the buzzers. Give him a haircut, man. He was gonna, sh he was gonna shave the dead man's head. If that's the case, then that's just more of him just fucking wasting his time. Like, what are you doing? You have something you're trying to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> you're turning human, Chucky. He should be trying to get Tyler, and he's like, ah, you know what? I'll give this fucker a haircut. I'm making good time. And again, Tyler, who is supposed to be with like the kids division of the school, is out there ready to do this paintball game. Yeah in the war game scenario. <laughs> Why is this child with these fucking older kids doing this? Why? Because they all hate him, I guess. To add even more confusion, uh, Cochrane mentions to Tyler back in the before, uh, kids aren't allowed near the shooting range because I think in the book he was there at one point and then later on in the movie and in the book he's there doing war games. Like, he was never trained with the fucking rifle. Why is he there now? Just to bring him along? Another question. Um, there's no... Okay, we're shooting paint bullets they're not paint balls they're paint bullets right so they use the same exact uh, rifle apparently so what it is it's a it's a mark around it, it's pretty much yeah just a, a paint shell um we never use them we use tracer rounds at one point where like they shoot a light and you can see where the bullets fly that was one training night we did we never did marker rounds and from what i could find marker rounds do just fit into regular rifles so uh someone someone pointed out that rifles are they're made so they can only shoot marker rounds. I couldn't find anything on that. I was wondering that because it's important coming up. I was wondering if the guns that are, they're using for this war game scenario nope, are rifles. only designed to fire a non-lethal... I'm sorry, rifle. Your gun's a dick, okay? <laughs> are only designed to fire a non-lethal round as opposed to keeping a, like an armory full of uh, dangerous weapons? Well, with blanks, it's uh, you, you have to like attach um, this thing to the barrel to keep it from act like you can actually fire because blanks have very little amount of gunpowder in them mm -hmm. um mark arounds again like i said i never uh i never actually worked with them 
But from what I understand, it's pretty much just like, yeah, you just put them in the in a regular rifle. So let me ask a question then. You're telling me Chucky, this little tiny doll person, had the time to take all of the marker bullets yeah. out of this out of all these rifles of the red team specifically that he takes them out of, replace them with regular bullets, and then let's just say they have this additional piece on it so that they can fire the markers. And he did this in like fucking 10 minutes yeah after he murdered larry cotton not to mention at basic the like bullets rounds were very very much uh secured to the point that we had to do strip searches every time we were done on the range uh Whoa. yeah oh yeah oh yes they don't fuck around that i believe they don't want another private pile moment no hell no also, it's it's like these are bolt action rifles, right? They only hold one fucking round. Uh, they have cartridges. They they there was. Do a, they? Yeah, they look like there were magazines on these rifles. Uh, oh, there was. Okay, I think there was. But another thing is like no one looked to see that these were live rounds. Right. They're just in the rifles, and that's it. They just leave them there. Yeah, I imagine there'd be like crazy safety checks, like make sure this thing isn't going to malfunction and fire a piece of shrapnel at you or something. A shit ton. A shit ton of safety checks, man. Okay, also, nobody's wearing masks or any type of, like, oh, no. armor or, like, padding. Eye protection. Yeah, and you get shot in the face with this fucking thing? Yeah, marker rounds, from what I understand, is, like, it's not paintball. Yeah, no. It's a round. It's going to hurt a lot. Yeah, yeah. They're meant to mark objects. They're not meant to actually hit people. Oh, dear God. But these fuckers are shooting them at people. <laughs> I just figured the screamers were like, listen, we need real bullets in these rifles. There's a thing called marker rounds. Just just go with it. Just go with it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you nailed it there, Smith. Um, so they're going to play this capture the flag game, basically. And the rule is, you know, if you get shot once, you're just out. And uh, so while this is all going on, Chucky is, you know, hunting down fucking Tyler. And, and you kind of watch as the two platoons, the red and the blue team, they, they march off into the the fields and they separate at one point and they both basically create home base like tents and shit all set up for the big battle in the morning but andy you know the whole time of course is still like shit i gotta get the tyler chucky's out there he's gonna kill him and he, he's bunking with whitehurst again and whitehurst's just like yeah i don't know if this is a good idea andy yeah yeah it's still keeping the events of, of a little while ago to himself like everyone's like hey you okay he's like fine well he won't yeah he won't he won't admit that the doll was what happened with the doll i just realized so uh Sheldon went through this whole whole uh, spiel about getting smoked because of a doll was missing. We just had a guy get murdered in a barber shop, and they're still letting whoever, like, in the mind of someone who just saw like, a murder victim, they just let him go do war games. They weren't called back in at all. Did everyone literally leave the place and then not go back in after they like had this meeting? I don't think this guy's death is ever even addressed. No, because everybody that's in the fucking school is out on this fucking trip. I guess. Yeah, this guy's just dead inside the academy and no one has found him yet. You're telling me no one was left behind? Not a single fucking person? No. Nope. They don't have a custodian? I think your theory about this being like some kind of Ponzi scheme was uh, it's pretty true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, it's a fake school. Fuck him. He, now he's gonna be a, now he's a fucking experiment he went down the fucking hole you know the owner calls to get an update and then he hears about the uh the dead body he's like yeah trump steaks slice them cook them sell them <laughs> he just fucking bruce wayne's down the fucking barber chair then he's gone uh but sir this is uh sergeant larry cotton yeah uh what did i say did i stutter sell him i said turn him into steaks i mean you did say he's sweeney todd to maybe they just turn him into fucking meat pies the barber you killed him we came he's like we came to take you it's like we did not come for scissors a shave and a haircut two bits. Yeah, and then Mario comes out and goes, ah, oh, yeah, is that a uh, Chucky in your pocket? You're just happy to see me. He kicks down the fucking door. You're never gonna believe this. And then Pinhead rips him apart with hooks. <laughs> to the fucking <laughs> Your main man, you can't spam. So yeah, so so Andy's gonna go look for fucking the other, the other group, the red team we'll call them. So he steals the map that uh, Shelton and his guys, his, let's call them the scouts, you know, figured out where they are at. Justin Wayland and maps, what the fuck? He kicked it into the fucking river right after, but he was like, Shelton sent out uh, reconnaissance people and they, he knows where the red team is and the red, t and Tyler's on the red team, he's like the only child on the fucking team and uh, 
before that, he briefly has an exchange with, like, De Silva, and they, like, kiss her or whatever to solidify some bullshit relationship that we're supposed to give a fuck about, and then he, uh, and then he hightails it to the, to the Red Camp. Tyler is walking around with fucking Chucky, by the way. There's, there's one child, and it's a group of, like, young adults and adults, and they manage to lose him. Well, there, okay, excuse me, there's two children, because one is in the fucking tent with Tyler, and so Andy gets to the Red Camp and, like, fucking goes, and he's like, where's Tyler? And he's like, eh, he went AWOL with some guy named Charles, Good night. And I'm like... What? Like, what? He does go AWOL with Chucky, but at one point, Chucky pulls a knife on Tyler, and Tyler pulls a bigger one on Chucky and fucking stabs him. Uh, not a bigger one. It's a smaller one. It's a smaller one that Andy gives him. Oh, that little tiny knife. You're right. I forgot about that. The the proverbial knife that slit his fucking Achilles tendon. In the book, they actually explain how Chucky got here this time instead of just him being there. He snuck into uh, um, Andy's rucksack. Ah. Are you serious? Yeah, there's a whole, uh, like, half a chapter of uh, Chucky's point of view inside the rucksack uh, getting tossed around and stuff. Are you fucking shitting me? That's fantastic. And Andy's just, like, fucking clueless about it. That's pretty good. At what point does he get out and then make it to the red camp and then take the kid? When uh, Andy goes up to look for Tyler, he brings a rucksack with him, and I guess they figured while filming it, it looked really dumb with this big giant because those rucksacks are heavy man and him just falling over in the woods like i guess wasn't good tension or whatever so they're like eh just have chucky appear in the woods it don't matter yeah fuck it while while this is all going on tyler bumps into the fucking other team and then andy bumps into them and you know shit's about to go down and uh I forget the semantics of it, but I know Chucky gets to Silva and has her at knife point, essentially. De Silva's, like, walking around and Chucky's in a tree and, like, ambushes her and, like, holds her up at knife point and then fucking Scoutmaster, whatever the fuck's him, right out of the tree. Oh, Erickson? Jumps down like a spider monkey. (laughs) Got down like a fucking spider monkey. Bless those little scouts. So, he fucking, uh, he gets to Silva and... He, 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 like, takes her, her walkie-talkie, and he, like, radios to Sheldon. He's like, put Andy on. And he's like, oh, right. give me the kid, and I'll give you the Silva, or I'll fucking kill yous. And again, this big group of people. This is where I was really starting to have problems with, with the, the, like, the the universe in this movie, because this is now a large group of people who's hearing a voice they don't recognize, and he's like, yeah, I've got one of your cadets, and I'm going to kill her. And everyone's like... Well, ain't that a thing? There's no context for it being a doll, and Andy's like, he's this guy has her, and he's going to hurt her and this child. And everyone reacts like, "Shut up, Andy! Shut up, you fucking dork!" I think in the book, Sheldon, like, uh, he's like getting really into the games. Like, he thinks like this is a lot of like this is like a real thing now, and he's getting super excited about it. But then I think in the book, he doesn't know how to work a walkie-talkie. <laughs> <laughs> he tries to push the button and it doesn't fucking work. And like his little like buddy cadet over there is just like, um, so you got to push the button and then you got to let it go and let him talk. Oh my God. And they took that out. And I'm so sad about that. Oh. <laughs> that would have been perfect for that character. Cause he's such an asshole. Well, cause Andy and Tyler, they catch up and you know, Chucky has a fucking live grenade and he, and he makes Tyler come over and he's going to start this fucking ritual again. This is at the point when Sheldon and the rest of the people show up and they just see Tyler over there and uh, I guess they just start unloading. Why are they shooting at this child and this doll? I don't know. Okay, yeah, here's the thing. They walk up and this doll is holding a grenade and talking. And they're just like, well, better shoot paint at it. They shoot it in the, f- they shoot him in the face with it. <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, now you have multiple, like, dozens of people seeing this thing moving around and talking on its own, holding a weapon, and no one cares. Well, Chucky laughs. He gives Shelton the finger for fucking shooting him with the paint, and then the red team comes in, and this motherfucker gets shot right in the sternum. Yeah, he gets fucking blown out the front, like in the front and out the back. He looks down at the wound, touches it, and goes, "Fuck me," and just falls over dead. Uh. Wouldn't you think that whoever shot Sheldon through the chest would be like, oh my fucking god, he's dead? And then be like, everybody stop shooting? Dude, there's like, there's way more shooting that goes on after this than should be warranted. Like, yeah. some dude is very clearly hurt, and they're just like, pew, 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 pew. Well, you know, you need an excuse for Chucky to fucking get away with Tyler, or go after Tyler, to this amusement park they kind of can see in the distance in a few scenes. Uh, <laughs> this fairground that's right next door. De Silva and fucking, and, and uh, Andy, like, saw it before when they went on the romantic walk she's like isn't it beautiful he's like yeah there's places to have fun i forgot they existed and i'm like this fucking set piece is cool 
but it's completely stupid. So fucking Tyler escapes underneath the fucking Jeep, and one of the guys is like, it was all your fault, Andy. You fucking shot all these fucking people, and you did this, and jumps on him. And then there's like a big uh, scramble of everybody trying to get this guy off Andy. And then fucking Chucky just throws his fucking grenade. He's like, so long, suckers. And then he fucking just fucks off. And Whitehurst, like, sacrifices himself. He, like, jumps on this fucking grenade and just... Yeah, he has his Steve Rogers moment. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If this fucking thing blew up under this guy, there would be bits of them all over the fucking place. It would be a fucking rain of blood on these people. I know, and I know, I think, CB, you can actually back this up. Like, I know grenades don't explode like they do in films, but I know it's like, it's a lot of shit that flies out of them. Shrapnel. It's more like a concussive blast, right? So, uh, we, we fired, like, only two actual live grenades. Uh, they're fucking loud. <laughs> And you feel that you feel that in your chest a lot. It's very much a concussion thing, but it very much is. It must be terrifying. Nah, not really. They made sure everything was uh, safe, but God forbid you you fucked up. No, but I mean, like in in like a real time situation. Jesus Christ. So the grenade thing is it's very much a shrapnel thing, um, much more than the concussion. But they do make uh, they they do make nice indentations. They do make a nice loud boom. Like this would have blown a fucking basketball sized hole in his torso, wouldn't it? Yes, it would have. Would it blew him in half. Would he not be a fucking? He'd be a fucking graboid shower on these fucking people. He he would have been ripped apart of the torso. Like it's you centered a, a, like the blast of this this explosive or like you know this this detonatable device on your chest with no space around it. Like it's gonna. It would have blown him off into the tree line too. I imagine. Mm, it, hard to say. Um. I, I, but, uh, I do remember basically we had to clean up everything afterwards, and, uh, those things were still kind of hot, those pieces of metal. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Again, this is a fucking military academy. This is not the fucking army. Like, this isn't boot camp. Where do you have, why do you have grenades on hand? On hand at the fucking school, what? It was right next to our A-bomb we have stored in the basement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, right next to the 50 cal. The case in point is, like, this guy would not be intact. He would actually probably be in one piece, but that middle torso would just be gone. <laughs> I was actually reading, uh, I'm getting off topic, I'm sorry, but like, there was one case uh, where a guy did survive, uh, belly flopping on top of but, like, it was a miracle. Holy shit. That he survived. And he had armor on, so, like, he had padding and everything. I survived. Did you get everything back in there? Uh, yes, everything. Oh, uh, man, he's just got, like, a big Band-Aid holding it all in. So, yeah, they, they, they go into this amusement park, and they're chasing after Tyler and Chucky. And the first motherfucker we meet is this mall cop-ass not-Marv character. <laughs> I really thought it was Daniel Stern for a second. It's mostly the hair, and from like a side profile, when he's in the dark lighting, I, I can kind of see it, and that's why I refer to him as not Marv. He's Nega Marv. Shadow Marv. He's in this fucking circus fucking, you know, security tent or what have you, and uh, Tyler fucking, you know, runs in, and he's like, oh, 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 you, you gotta help me. Charles is trying to kill me. <laughs> and he's like, all right, kid, uh, Charles, huh? Sit down. Here's a piece of gum. You don't happen to mean Charles Lee Ray, though. Lakeshore Strangler, do you? He's like, yep, exactly. And he's like, yeah, I didn't think so. And he's like, this will cheer you up. And he guess who he fucking pulls out of behind this fucking filing cabinet? This disgusting, fucking filthy ass fucking doll. And he's like, this will make you happy, right? And I'm like, why do we keep picking this fucking thing up? No one questions this thing's presence. It's like, oh, this is cool. I hope a child wanders in. Oh, it gets better in the book. Oh, here we go. So instead of a security guard, it was actually two cops driving down. They see Tyler on the road. And they pick him up and they talk to him while driving. And the like the scene plays out the same way. It's like, oh, we know where we'll cheer you up. This raggedy ass doll we just found on the road. <laughs> it being cops makes it so much worse. It does. Now here's my question. Does he ki does he attack the cops while they're driving? Because he did that in the first movie and the second movie. He did. He grabbed one of the uh he grabbed one of the uh, the pistols, not gun. Remind you, not gun. <laughs> <laughs> grabbed one of the pistols and shot both of them. And I guess they were just like, what, a doll? What? You'd be surprised one of them didn't have a heart attack or something. Yeah, yeah. And the fucking car just crashed, I guess, question mark? Uh, no, it just kind of coasted down. He's like, it was, uh, the book kind of was just played as like Andy found uh, the car afterwards. They would only see the whole thing. Oh, uh, like he drove it into the amusement park? Chucky's like, look, kid, get up here and hit the brakes for me. It, they just managed to walk to the amusement park, and you're right. Like, the thing was like, what, a mile away from the from the camp? It was so far, dude. Well, you know, they, they, they catch up, and they find this fucking 
not Marv, Negan Marv, dead on the ground. And, uh, you know, the chase is con- the chase continues. Chucky has a gun now, doesn't he? Well, he, has a- he stole the uh, this dude's pistol he had in the drawer. The little tiny Beretta or whatever the fuck it is. The little PP7. Yeah, it can fit in his little fucking doll hands. The Silva pulls out the fucking Colt Python when they fucking find his ass dead. Yeah, his fucking revolver, his uh, Barry Burton ass fucking hand cannon. Uh, and, and then we go to this fucking uh, Keensburg ass haunted house. They were in fucking Satan's Den from Ghoulies 2. This sequence is forever long and features lots of the same shit over and over again. It's a good set piece, but it has no business in this movie. No, and it's lots of, like, it's Andy being really incompetent for a few minutes, Tyler running all over the place, Chucky just being frustrated, and it's like, this thing popped up, and Andy was scared by it, and this thing popped up, and then Tyler was scared by it, and there's more thing, and then the roller coaster car comes through, <sighs> and there's more shenanigans involving the, 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 the apparatuses inside this ride. The stupidest thing for me was when Chucky's like, this looks like a good spot, put me down. Like, right on a coffin, in the middle of the fucking ride, in between the fucking rails where the carts come in. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, go in a fucking back exit or something. What are you in the ride for? Wait, that's the stupidest thing? For me. Not the scythe? It's razor sharp. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the scythe. That's what gives him the Terminator face. That wasn't in the second movie. Fuck. Yeah, the, the scythe that is sharp enough to slice his face. Oh my god, right? Imagine if that fucking coaster, like, malfunctioned for half a second and it went, like, a second late than it was later than it was supposed to. Is it just gonna chop someone's head off? Just decapitates a child. They'll just wait eight years. They'll just wait eight years and put the ride up again, man. <laughs> This uh, this fucking fun house. It's not even a fun house. It's like a roller coaster spook house. It's a it's a condensed version of Disney's Haunted Mansion. Yeah, the point is. It is completely unsafe. There is a sharpened scythe swinging from the fucking ceiling. There is a giant fan with no fucking grate on it just chilling. Yeah, there's an aggro crag made out of skulls. <laughs> yeah. Moe's there just, like, blowing her whistle. This is the aggro crag, and they're gonna climb it with Chucky. Can Andy climb to the top before Chucky steals Tyler's soul? Let's watch. I also want to note, as Andy is climbing up this previously mentioned Skull Hill, you know, made out of plastic or whatever. In the first two films, every time he does this incantation, fucking lightning comes down and, like, hits the ground. Okay. He did this at least once or twice in this movie so far, and this never happened. And now I guess just because it's the climax. Yeah, remember that part from the first two when the lightning came down? Let's bring that back. Try to save that effects budget. Well, I feel like, I feel like he's actually able to say the whole thing this time sure and he says the whole thing in the second movie too but he takes too long but he takes too long but he says the whole thing in this movie and it like nothing happens <laughs> like okay can we talk for a fa- uh for a second about how uh this lightning was striking this pile of skulls inside a building <laughs> In the exact spots that Andy needed the grab to to proceed. Raiden's his boy, right? He just calls in <laughs> like, lightning favors. Christopher Lambert's there <laughs> with his fucking haircut. I'll do this for you real quick. Not even it's fucking what's his face from Dexter. James Remar. Yeah, fucking James Remar. Not even Christopher Lambert. And he's like, hey, you like my haircut? Here's some lightning. Oh God. Shao Kahn's my brother. <laughs> or whatever. So De Silva and uh, Chucky get into like a firefight for like a second. And then Chucky shoots her in the leg, and she's like, here, take the fucking hand cannon and go kill him. You could do it. Take the rocket launcher, shoot the tyrant. <laughs> oh, God. Wait for Brad to drop it by the mountain. Right, because as he's trying to climb up the Skull Mountain, and the lightning keeps knocking him off it, essentially. I guess he just is like, fuck it, and pulls this gun out that the Silva gave him, which I don't know why he didn't do this from the beginning. He's a shit shot. There was this whole thing in the movie about how he's really bad at fucking hitting targets that we didn't really talk about. He's fucking taking training lessons from Casey Gallagher is what he's doing. Right, yeah. I mean, even with the puppet and everything. (laughs) You know I don't like guns, okay? It's not even loaded. But it's not guns. It's not a gun. Oh, right, yeah, it's a pistol, you're right. But I guess this is, like, the payoff on that plot line? He remembers the face of his father, and he shoots this fucking doll. Dark Tower deep cut. At some point, this fucking scythe that comes down, I guess supposed to scare the riders, comes off and hits Chucky in the face and cleaves off his cheek and eyeball. Is this just to make him look scarier? Yes. Because they did it in the last two movies. They gotta do it here. Also because Terminator. Actually, in the in the book, that Terminator reference is pretty true because they des- he describes it as like, you know, a combination of machine and human and organs and, and machinery all together. And 
it wasn't described very well in the book, but at least like it, it does kind of bring on a cool imagery. Uh, while in the movie, it just kind of is like flesh. I mean, it still looks really cool. Yeah, I'm a cybernetic organism. So Chucky gets his face sliced off, and so he has this like Terminator face. The rest of the climax, even when he's up there doing his chanting, and he's just screaming the whole time. Yeah, he's like he's Jeremy Ironsing it up from Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Justin Whalen doesn't know it yet, but he feels the disturbance in the fucking force. <laughs> so first shot, he completely misses. The second shot, he blows off Chucky's arm. And Chucky's just like, ah! And then he shoots him in the fucking chest. He blows him away. Yeah, blows him away. And then not only does he kill, you know, blow him away, but he gets literally blown away into this fucking fan. I laughed like a maniac when this happens because it is a glorious spectacle of, okay, this doll does a fucking slow mo fall from this aggro crag into this un this completely unsafe fan thing from like Resident Evil Six and hits these blades and it's a s nice beautiful slow mo shot of just goo and plastic and clothing and blood and hair. Oh, it's a, it's a lovely disgusting explosion. I mean, you waited the whole movie for this part. <laughs> oh, I did. It was so satisfying. And part two is so fucking bonkers that like I don't think you could ever top that. You could never top it. No, you can't. This is pretty satisfying i would have been okay if the movie just ended here you know andy saved tyler everything's gonna end in a, you know hooray whitehurst is dead shelton's dead you know people are dead so it's a little sad but other overall they say he saved the kid nope uh, we go back to outside and then there's like cops and shit and De silva's like in a fucking ambulance and she's like did we win and he's like yup see ya i'm going i'm going with the cops now i'm being arrested because all these deaths are being pinned on me because they're never going to believe me that the fucking doll was alive he says something like yeah i've been through this before it's fine like no it's not dude you're almost fucking of like age an age where you can be like charged with these crimes yeah at some point they're gonna stop slapping the wrist and start charging with murder and then we cut to this fucking guy picking up trash and then the movie ends the uh the book actually has a very very different ending oh good oh god tell me i'm so excited okay so first off in the uh in the amusement park uh good guy dolls are being distributed around because the company for some reason still decided to pass this doll around even though their ceo died <laughs> are you fucking kidding me no and it was kind of cool because like annie's like Picking dolls up, thinking like, are you Chucky? And it's like, just the dumbass doll. Oh. And they couldn't find Tyler for a minute. It was like tension building. They do go into the haunted house, but they leave. And the climax is actually on one of those um, those uh, tilt rides where it's like you're in a ball and it's like octopus arms with a bunch of other balls flying around. Yeah, yeah. Andy chases after Tyler and Chucky because they go in one and he starts climbing it even though it's operating. And the operator's just like, well, whatever, fine, I guess. And <laughs> he starts doing the chanting in the ball. Hey, man, it's your life. Pretty much. As long as you bought a ticket, I'm cool. He starts doing the chanting, and lightning starts attacking the uh, the ride itself. And uh, also, Chucky's trying to stab Andy through the grating in the in the seat. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and uh, but eventually, uh, Andy opens the door and just goes point blank with the with the pistol and just goes bam 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 into chucky's head which is what should have happened yeah i kind of like that and that's kind of reminiscent of the first film because uh when he's in fucking chris sarandon's cop car he's like trying to stab him through the fucking seat that's a crazy scene yeah because he can't hit the brake because he keeps getting him like under the ass yeah it goes a lot like further and like you said like same thing with the movies like he should have ended before uh they go to the cops andy and the silver like they'll believe us this time it's like no they won't no, they won't. No, never. I think there's a there's a issue that gets brought up at the book ending because if Andy's like, yeah, this killer doll did it, and they're like, hmm, and they look down and this doll has brain matter, I think you'd probably go, huh. Actually, this is, it's really fucking dumb. They don't collect the, the, the remains of the doll, even though it's clearly blood and, and machinery together, and it's like, this is obviously something. They don't put it in an evidence bag. The garbage collector looks at it and it's like, huh, I may bring this home. It's something to study. It's like, you're a garbage collector. What? Like, no. What the fuck? That's fucking stupid. The police from Lawnmower Man who worked on that crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Angelo shows up. He's like, he's like, ah, yes. Bring the doll matter to my home. I'm going to put it together. Walks through fucking police tape. He's like, hi, I don't know you people, but what happened here? <laughs> Can I have that? Chucko man? That's kind of that's kind of the uh, the book. It's like, it's very, uh, like, there's some pretty good ideas that could have stayed, but then other things are just like, 
I, I'm glad they changed it in the movie, but they changed it either for the worse or just the same. Yeah, like, why even bother at that point? I mean, to be fair, in Bride of Chucky, I thought they did that kind of cool where, like, it opens up with, you know, this cop goes into, like, an evidence locker and he pulls out this fucking plastic bag, which is just the remains of Chucky all cut up from the fan, which is kind of cool. It's like an unsolved case, right? And it's just like in there. But um, yeah, that's the movie. That's the movie and the book for you. How about that? Double whammy. Yeah. Movie book dumpster. Movie book dumpster. <laughs> so, uh, so where are we putting this, fellas? Yeah, it's in the fucking dumpster. I didn't like this movie very much. <laughs> I Like I said, I already voiced my disdain for the Child's Play movies, and this one is just... If I had to pick a word to describe this, it's fucking lethargic. Oh, it's sleepy. It's sleepy, and Bo- Arlen told me he watched this, and about 20 minutes in, he says he got up and just cleaned his room. <laughs> he was just that bored. It's It felt like that, and like by the 40-minute mark, I think I even said the chat, I was like, nothing has fucking happened in this movie. It's 45 minutes in, and there's just nothing going on. And it's all the build-up to the fan, really, the, the whole climax, and, like, it just doesn't feel very exciting. It, it feels like part eight in a series as opposed to part three. Didn't like it at all. Fucking push it down in the dumpster. I don't know where it's next to, but it's next to some garbage. Yeah, so this is this is a shelf movie for me only because um, I think it's one of the last times that I could enjoy this series, right? So I'll hang on to it. And that's what I'm here for. You know, I'm here for Chucky. I'm not really here for anything else. And I just want to see that puppet talk and do things and kill people. I will watch part three over Seed, Curse, and Cult any fucking old day of the week. I would watch it on loop for 24 hours before I watch any of those again. It's fun. It's not the best child's play. It's certainly not the worst child's play. And it's actually a child's play, not a Chucky movie. You know what I mean? Right. One, two, three, and Bride are fine. It's strictly middle of the road for me. Like, I could live without it, but I'm going to keep it. And I'll tell you one thing. I will bet all of you $20 that this film is better than that fucking remake that just came out. I'm going to find out. I'm going to see it. So, uh... (laughs) I'll let you know. I, I um I can't be mean to this movie, mostly because it's just not like it's not offensively bad, it's not so bad it's good entertaining, it just kinda is, which I know is like not what you really want. Right. If it's gonna be bad, at least be entertaining. And like there are some moments after coming back from basic and like seeing all the things like that I could watch in a new light. It's just it's just gonna be a thing I watch. It's not going to be something I own or anything. Uh, same goes for the book. Like, there are some funny moments, but, uh, like, I've read worse, I've watched worse, man. Yeah. No, I'm with uh, Smith there, you know. I think this would probably be a shelf movie kind of for the reason that Joe just gave. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm if I'm going to watch Child's Play, I'm going to probably watch the first one, maybe the second one. Um, but just to kind of have the set, I'd probably have all three on the shelf. Um, you know, it's, it's hanging by a fucking thread, uh, between this and, uh, you know, the top of the dumpster. It's not even really in, uh, contention for an eggshell crate, (laughs) but, uh, you know, I'd honestly say it's at the bottom of the shelf, but, you know, you gotta keep that shit alphabetical, so it's clearly, like, right at the top. It's in a different box. Right, yeah, yeah, it's in a, it's, it's like, it's like Joe's vault. It's like, it's in there, but it's in the box in the corner under the stairs. Yes. Right next to Billy's corpse. Um, (laughs) you know, it, it, it is what it is. I feel like if I didn't watch the first two films as a lead-in, I'd be a little harsher on this movie, but uh, I enjoyed those so much. Uh, you know, f- pretty much seeing them for the first time, let's say, since it's been so goddamn long, that, uh, you know, I didn't totally hate this. Thanks for having me, guys. I had a lot of fun going dumpster diving with you. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on and uh, spitting your knowledge of <laughs> the fucking novelization of this thing. Yeah, this is this was fascinating. It was super interesting. You guys uh, asked me to come in mostly for the military stuff, Uh I'm sure your viewers are probably wondering, it's like, wait, if you just got out of basic, why are you doing this? How are you doing this? <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm National Guard, which basically means that uh, on weekends, the government trusts me with operating a fucking howitzer, but my manager doesn't trust me with a key to the store or a price scanner. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess the, to end it, uh, my name's C.B. Smith. I run a YouTube channel where I talk about books and adaptations. I don't spoil as much, but uh, it was fun to do it here. I'm sorry, what's your YouTube channel called again? Uh, the channel is called C.B. Smith. The show is called Taking a Page. And uh, last video I did was the first season of Game of Thrones. And for Pride Month, I'm doing uh, Brokeback Mountain. Oh, that's that's awesome. And I, I said to Smith uh, when, when he made that Game of Thrones video... 
I was like, damn, you know, that show really burned my ass. But like that first season in that book is so good. It's like it, it, it's got me wanting to go back and rewatch it and reread that book. Go find C.B. Smith on YouTube. Give him a, a subscribe and uh, check out some of those videos. So that's it. That's Child's Play 3 from 1991, directed by Jack Bender. Hey, everybody, if you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or Podbean. And make sure to leave us a five-star review if you dig the show, because it helps us get out of the bottom of the dumpster into more eardrums. Yeah, and if you're on the social medias, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. I'm C.B. Smith. Thanks for visiting the dumpster. Don't fuck with the chuck. <laughs> oh, my God.